People versus Alan Andrade. OHCR 1319. Let's see, it's 8.33 on April 20th, 2009. The parties all appear, including the defendant, who for the record is in plain clothes. And we are scheduled to continue with the people's case in chief. I think there's two issues that need to be raised before we bring the jury in in its entirety. One is that the court this morning received a handwritten letter from a juror um, indicating that um, there was information on the questionnaire that she had that she didn't include in the questionnaire and she believed that she, we needed to know about this. How do the parties want to resolve that issue? Would you like to call her individually and ask questions of her? I think it'd be appropriate to do that in chambers, Your Honor. I agree. I, I'm not quite sure even what she's saying. So. I, I, so I think we should. Okay, that's fine. So we'll talk to her in chambers. Uh, and the other issue is some of the uh, telephone calls that were allegedly made by the defendant uh, to his girlfriend or ex-girlfriend, Felicia, and whether they're relevant or not. The court has reviewed those segments of the statements the defendant made, those very limited segments for about uh, 38 seconds on one and 30 seconds on another. And I think Ms. Candelius indicated that she believed they were not relevant. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. Is there anything else you want to say regarding that issue? Judge, I think um, regarding the the brief statement by Felicia Mendoza that um, about the death penalty, I think that that's inappropriate to command. I know that the court has instructed the jurors um, that this is not a death penalty case, but that was obviously something that was a concern for them at least, or for her at least, at the beginning of the case. So I think that that's inappropriate. Um, on the other phone call, regarding whether or not um, she should be checked, um, I, I think that that's also irrelevant to this case and um, gets into an area of testimony that would not be appropriate or relevant. I'm sorry, it gets into an area? Of testimony that's not appropriate or relevant. You think issues dealing with 18.3407? Yes. Mr. Miller? But maybe you could explain to me the relevance of those statements. Well, which, which one? You're Both. Talking? First of all, the, the statement regarding Felicia Mendoza, uh, she gets fairly emotional uh, discussing possible penalties on a few occasions throughout the course of, of their discussions. And the defendant's, I guess, lack of reaction, we think, is very relevant to this case. Um, and secondly, she also alludes to uh, uh, her, her mother or grandmother putting together a petition for the defendant. Um, and that's alluded to in two of the other phone calls, uh, which, which gives, I, I guess, makes it relevant so the jurors know what, what he's talking about at that point. Um, I, I know it's, I think it's clear that this is not a death penalty case. The court's made it clear. Uh, that there's even an instruction that the jury can't consider penalties, but his reaction uh, or lack thereof during that, during that phone call we think is very relevant. As to the other um, call, as far as if she should uh, be checked or get a checkup based on um, the defendant's activities uh, while they've been dating, um, he responds to that by saying, I ain't been with nobody, no one. Um, and we think that's very relevant to the facts of this case. Uh, and it, it's certainly, um, well, we think it's relevant for a number of reasons. I think the court can see why. Um, so I'll just leave it at that for those calls. Thank you. Uh, the court has considered the arguments of counsel. I've also reviewed those relevant portions in People's Exhibit. It's marked as pretrial slash one. The court is going to find that the statements, uh, based on the totality of the statements and the rule of completeness with regard to the other phone calls is relevant for both, for the reasons stated by the prosecutor. And the court's gonna find when looking at the maximum probative value of these statements, when reviewing all of his statements, um, versus the prejudicial effect, the court's going to find that the probative value is not outweighed by the 
um, the prejudicial effect is not outweighed by the probative value. And so the court is going to allow these two statements to come in. So let's go into chambers with the juror who wants to speak to us about an issue regarding a, a response to a question in the questionnaire that was not done completely to see if she can remain on this jury. I also had one other issue to sure. bring up. Ms. Tyree is in the courtroom yes. in the pink, and um, she, we did not um, have an opportunity to talk to her. We attempted to uh, on several occasions. Therefore, she hasn't been advised on certain things she should not say on the stand for obvious reasons. I would ask the court to uh, um, also talk to her in chambers about what she cannot say on the stand since we haven't had an opportunity to do that. Sure. So we'll do that after we speak to the juror, okay? We'll be right back. Thank you. Yes. Well, you, that, that one, if you could just leave where it is, if you could just adjust the long one there. Okay. Perfect. And if you can please introduce yourself to the jury by stating your name and spelling your last name. James Andrew Wilkerson IV, W-I-L-K-E-R-S-O-N. Thank you. You may examine. Thank you. How are you employed? I am a forensic pathologist and I'm self-employed. And do you do deputy coroner work for Weld County? Yes, I do. Okay. Can you tell the jury a little bit about your educational background? Yes. Um, after high school, I went to college, um, finishing at Birmingham Southern College in Birmingham, Alabama with a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry in 1982. That was followed by medical school at the University of Alabama School of Medicine on an Army scholarship, leading to an MD degree in 1986. I did a year of family practice training in the Army um, in Fort Gordon in 87, and then 88 through 91 I did uh, an anatomic and clinical pathology residency at Brook Army Medical Center. After the completion of that, um, that led to board certification in anatomic and clinical pathology. Did three years in the, in the Army at Fort Polk, followed by a forensic pathology fellowship year of training in 94-95 at the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology, and that led to board certification in forensic pathology. Dr. Wilkerson, do you hold any medical license in a state besides Colorado? Yes, I'm licensed in Colorado, California, Texas, uh, and my Alabama license is inactive and also Wyoming. What professional groups or associations do you belong to? I belong to the College of American Pathologists, uh, the National Association of Medical Examiners, Larimer County Medical Society, uh, Colorado Medical Society. Um, I think that's about it. Okay. Can you tell the jury what pathology is? Pathology literally means the study of disease in this country. Most pathologists will be hospital-based and will run the laboratories, or if you have a biopsy or a surgery, they're the ones that look at the specimen and tell you what it is, if it's cancer, perhaps how far it's spread. Uh, forensic pathology is a subspecialty of pathology that is concerned with the cause and manner of death. Uh, manners can be homicide, suicide, accident, uh, or natural. And we do an investigation and perform an autopsy to determine the cause and manner of death. And then we um, use what we know in medicine to um, deal with problems in the law or, or do testimony like I'm doing today. And have you been qualified as a forensic pathologist before? Yes, I have. Where? Um, approximately 70 times total, uh, most of them in California, but also in Texas, Louisiana, Maryland, Denver, and Adams County. Okay. And about how many autopsies do you think you've performed over your career? Approximately 2,400. And as you stated earlier, a forensic pathologist is called upon at times to give an opinion as to the cause of death. Have you been called upon to give an opinion as to someone's cause of death? Yes, I have. Okay. And have you seen injuries due to blunt force trauma? Yes, I have. Okay. 
Your Honor, at this time I'd offer Dr. Wilkerson as an expert in forensic pathology. No. And the court pursuant to Rule 702 of the Rules of Evidence is going to find that Dr. Wilkerson is a expert in the field of forensic pathology based on his knowledge, skill, experience, training, and education, and may testify and offer an opinion with regard to the field of forensic pathology. Thank you. Dr. Wilkerson, did you perform an autopsy on Angie Zapata on um, July 18th, 2008 at 10 a.m.? Yes, I did. Okay. And where did this autopsy take place? It took place at McKee Medical Center Morgue in Loveland, Colorado. Can you tell the jury the size and weight of the victim? Yes, I can. The weight is 131 pounds and 71 inches in height. As part of the autopsy, were there photographs taken? Yes, there were. Okay. <clears throat> Judge, at this time, if I could request that you guys shut off your computers. <clears throat> We're going to show some autopsy photos, and I just wanted to make sure everything was shut down. Okay, I don't believe this is on. It's not. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? Yes. Dr. Wilkerson, I'm handing you what's already been marked and admitted as, admitted as People's Exhibits 41, 42, 43, and 44. If we could talk about 41 first. Um, and you're going to have to look at your picture because they're not going to be shown on the big screen. So they, they don't have any view of these? They do inside the jury box. Okay. Yes. Can you tell us what 41 depicts? 41 uh, depicts the decedent. Um, laying down and then the we've covered up the, the chest and you can see the injuries to the face and to the lips. And exhibit 42? 42 is a photograph of the skull with the scalp reflected um, both forwards and backwards. And Exhibit 43? 43 is the front of the base of the skull um, and depicts the injuries there. And 44? 44. 44 is the top of the skull. Um, this is the bottom picture of uh, 42. It's just the other side after the skull cap has been removed. This is the brain side of the skull. Thank you. May I approach the witness again, Your Honor? Yes. Dr. Wilkerson, I'm handing you what's been marked as People's Exhibit 62. Do you know what that is? Yes, these are my autopsy notes that I made at the time of autopsy. Okay. And would that help you in assisting, or would that assist you in helping to describe to the jury the injuries that you saw on the victim that day? Yes. Okay. And it's a fair and accurate representation of the diagram that you made at the autopsy? Yes, it is. At this time, I'd move to admit People's 62. People 62 is received into evidence. Welcome to publish if you like. Thank you. Can you tell the jury about what that diagram depicts? The It depicts the injuries, um, the blunt force injuries that uh, we saw at autopsy. Now, blunt force injuries are injuries incurred when a a body or a portion of a body strikes an object or the object strikes the body. And there are several types. Um, contusions or bruises are one type. Uh, lacerations or what you might call cuts are another type, but they're actually more of a tearing of a skin rather than a cutting of a skin. Abrasions or scrapes and then fractures. And we saw all of these types of injuries. Doctor, if I could get you, may I have permission for the witness to step down? If I could have you step down, there's a pointer here behind you. Okay. You want me to go through things? Yes, please. Okay. And if you could have the pictures with you as well, if any of them correspond to any of the 
um, injuries that you're pointing out there on the diagram, if you could let the record reflect that. Perhaps you can stand on this side also so everybody, including the defense, can see you. And I can use that microphone. Uh, I want you to keep that microphone where it is, but I think as long as you speak up, we can all hear you. Okay. Okay, like we said, there, were, there was blunt force injuries. And I'm going to start um, with the, the forehead. There was an abrasion or scrape up on the right forehead. You can also see that in People's Exhibit number 41. Then both eyes had injuries. The right eye had a contusion around it and then had some lacerations up in the eyebrow or tearing type injuries but that you would call a cut, probably most people would call a cut. So we had some of those up there. And then in the, the conjunctiva, which is the membrane over the eye, between the eyelid and the eyeball, there was also hemorrhage. And in that location, it's called ecchymosis, just a fancy word for bleeding in the, in the conjunctiva. <coughs> On the left eye, we also had a, a contusion surrounding the eye, and we had lacerations on both sides of the eye, up by the nose and by the, the lateral part of the eye or the outside part of the eye. Those are, all those injuries are somewhat visible on, on 41. The nose had a laceration which you can see a small abrasion, laceration. It was also contused. And then the, the lips on the left side also had contusions and lacerations or tearing. And that can also be seen on Exhibit 41. Behind the right ear, there was a, a large contusion or bruise as well. Doesn't really show is behind the right ear. And most of these injuries were in the, in the facial area. So that's what these are, is the measurements, uh, two to five inches from the top of the head and three inches to either side of the midline incorporated most of these injuries. There, were, there was also ecchymosis in the left eye or bleeding into the, into the eyelid. And then if we move on to 42, that is what happens when you're looking at the top of the head and you reflect the scalp forward and backwards. And it shows the, the bruising. Um, there's a loop of hair on there. That is the right side. And the left side um, shows bruising and there's also bruising on the top of the head. We call that subgaleal contusion or subscalp contusion in the report. Moving forward from there, we then remove the skull with a saw, and that is depicted in, in number 44. And you can see that there is a, a fracture that corresponded to, the, to the, the contusion that you saw in 42 on that left side. Probably the, the most important picture, the most important picture in the group is number 43. And that shows the constellation of injuries that resulted in, in Angie's death, and that is multiple skull fractures here. That should be nice and smooth. Should look, you know, nice and smooth. But it's all broken up, and it's broken up back to the temporal lobes, which is just in front of the ears. So the whole frontal skull has been broken up, and the underlying brain beneath it was contused or bruised and lacerated and torn as well. The bleeding and swelling from that, that injury 
ultimately caused herniation or caused pressure on the brain such that, that the breathing and heartbeat would stop. Thank you. Go ahead and have a seat. Dr. Wilkerson, as part of your autopsy, did you take swabs from the victim in this case? Yes, we did. Uh, where did you take swabs from? We took uh, oral swabs and anal swabs. And those swabs were given over to Investigator Buckingham, is that right? That's correct. Did you also take scrapings from under the victim's fingernails? Yes. And what did you do with those? Those were also turned over to Investigator Buckingham. You stated a moment ago when you were showing one of the exhibits that there were multiple skull fractures. Um, based on the injuries that you observed, are you able to tell the jury whether or not the injuries sustained were the result of one blow or multiple blows? Multiple blows. Dr. Wilkerson, do you think that a fire extinguisher could have caused these injuries? Yes. And were you able to form an opinion with a reasonable degree of medical certainty as to the cause of death of Angie Zapata? Yes, I was. And what is that? Blunt force injuries to the head. And what was her manner of death? Homicide. If I could have one moment, Your Honor. Dr. Wilkerson, were there any other significant or serious injuries on Ms. Zapata other than the skull fractures that you noted? There were many facial fractures, which are, is part of the skull as well. Um, there were there was a, a bru uh, excuse me a bruise or an abrasion on the left side of the neck, and there was a scratch on the a couple of scratches on the back of the right hand, but they were pretty superficial. Thank you. I guess we should explain for the jury, Dr. Wilkerson, what's the difference between manner of death and cause of death? Cause of death is the specific event or injury um, that led to the death, and the manner of death is the circumstances under which the was injury occurred. Um, a homicide is uh, those injuries were inflicted by another person. Thank you. No further questions. Cross examination. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Um, Dr. Wilkerson, you just testified that um, the um, cause of death was um, multiple blows to the head. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And you can you can only actually say that um, Justin Zapata had been hit in the head more than once. Is that right? That's correct. You, can, you don't know how many times? No, I cannot say okay. exactly how many. And the district attorney also asked you if you had um, an opinion as to whether a fire extinguisher could have caused these injuries, and you stated that a fire extinguisher could have? That's correct. Um, and in reality, really any sort of heavy object, a number of different objects could have caused these types of injuries? Yes, any firm, blunt object could do oh. that. And sometimes in, when you're doing an autopsy, you can kind of get an idea of what type of item was used in in hitting someone, is that right? There'll be patterns? That's correct. Sometimes you get a, uh, an abrasion or a bruise that has a specific pattern to it that you can then match with, with the instrument or weapon. And in this case, you were not able to discern any pattern? That's correct. Okay. Um, so you can't say that a fire extinguisher did cause these injuries? Not specifically. They're consistent with the fire extinguisher, but I can't say the fire extinguisher is the only thing that could have caused these injuries. Sure. And um, the district attorney also asked you um, 
Well, let me back up. There were no other, um, there were no penetrating injuries on Justin Zapata, is that right? That's correct. Okay. And you, as part of an autopsy, your job is to examine the entire body, correct? That's correct. Okay. So the arms, torso, legs, all parts of the person? Yes. The, the whole body is examined. Okay. Externally and internally. And there were no other um, blunt force trauma injuries on any other part of the body except for the head and face? And the superficial ones on the hand. Okay. And the, um, the injuries to uh, Justin Zapata's head and face were all in the front area. Is that right? Yes, there was a little bit of bruising on the top of the head, but the majority of the, the injuries were to the face. There was one bruise behind the right ear, too, that was fairly significant. Okay. When the district attorney started asking you questions, she first asked you if you performed an autopsy on Angie Zapata, correct? That's correct. And the, um, your report actually lists the decedent as Justin Zapata, correct? Yes, that is his official name, uh, even though the preferred alias is Angie. Okay. And Justin Zapata was, in fact, a male, correct? Yes, biologically male. Okay. And when you performed the autopsy, um, when you first started, he was still clothed, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And you, as part of the whole autopsy process, you remove all the clothing? That's correct. And part of what was removed was a bra and some breast gels, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. If I can have just a moment. Do you have no further questions? Can you redirect it? No, no. Thank you, Doctor. You may step down. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Feel free to adjust that long microphone. Once you're settled in, sir, if you can introduce yourself to the jury by stating your name and spelling your last name. Okay. I am Jerry Kimmel, K-I-M-M-E-L. Thank you. You may examine. Thank you. By whom are you employed, Mr. Kimmel? Two Rivers Investment. Okay. And how long have you been employed there? Ten years. Is this also known as Tri Property? Correct. Okay. And what are your duties there at Tri Property? I am the maintenance supervisor. So what do you do as part of your job? I schedule the maintenance department uh, crews. I deal with contractors uh, to do the work on our properties. Okay. I am going to show you uh, People's Exhibit 5 which has already been admitted, it'll be there on the screen next to you. That's the interior of one of the apartments that Tri Property owns and manages. Do you recognize that? Yes. Okay. And if I could point out to you, um, maybe up here on the big screen. Do you see this bracket right here? That I can get that zoomed in on? You should be able to see it next to you as well, okay. Mr. Kimmel. Yes. Okay. Do you know what that is? It is a it's a holder for a fire extinguisher. Okay. And is each apartment at this location equipped with a fire extinguisher? Yes. Um, the apartment in this case was apartment number eight. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And at some point, the police had custody and control over that apartment for a little while. Is that correct? Correct. All right. Um, at some point, did Tri Property take back control of that apartment? Yes. Okay. And the fire extinguisher from apartment eight, was it missing at the time that Tri Property took back over the property? Yes. Okay. Have you had some contact with the police in reference to this case? Um, yes, I was called out and talked to Detective Brantner. Okay. And was that on July 30th? Yes. Okay. And did you provide him with a sample fire extinguisher? From, I did. Okay. May I press the witness, Your Honor? Yes. And I've already shown Defense Counsel People's Exhibit 84. Mr. Kimmel, 
Admiral, do you know what that is? Uh, yes, it's a fire extinguisher that we supply for all of our apartments. Okay. And this is the one that you gave to Detective Brantner? It is. Okay. And does it appear to be in the same condition as the last time that you saw it? Yes. Okay. Your Honor, at this time, I'd move to admit Peoples 84. Any objection? No objection. Peoples 84 is received into evidence. Thank you. Is there some type of written materials in there? Um, yes, Your Honor. It's packaged so that it's outside of the box. And then the actual original evidence tag is packaged in there as well. This is the box just flattened down. Okay, so the extinguisher as well as the box that it comes in is part of 84. Yes, and the bracket as well that comes in the box. And there's no objection for all those soft documents. Is that right? No, sir. Okay, thank you. Your Honor, may I approach the witness again? Yes. Mr. Kimmel, I'm handing you what's marked as Peebles Exhibit 86. Does this appear to be the same type of fire extinguisher that was in the apartment um, at the time that the fire extinguisher went missing? Yes. And if I could get that back. Your Honor, at this time I would move to admit um, People's Exhibit. I'm sorry, I just left. 86. Objection. Foundation. Let's go into chambers. Should I bring the exhibits or? Yes, please. If you could just wait for a few minutes, we'll be right back. Cool. Yes, please. Let me know when you're ready, Leslie. I'm sorry. I'm just waiting for Leslie to be ready. Are you ready? And so for the record, uh, the court is overruling the objection. People's 86 is received into evidence, as is People's 39 and 40. Your Honor, at this time, I'd like to publish all of those exhibits to the jury. That's fine. Um, if I could start with the photographs first. Um, I'm sorry, it was people's 38, 39, and 40. I apologize. Excuse me, 38, 39, 40, and 86. This is people's exhibit. Sorry, people's exhibit 38. People's Exhibit 39 and People's Exhibit 40. And if I could also publish People's Exhibit 86, which corresponds to People's Exhibit 40 to the jury. Yes. You can give it to my clerk and they'll give it to the jury. Mr. Kimmel, what happens when you need a new fire extinguisher for a property managed by Tri Property? If the tenant requests one? Yes, or if one's missing, let's say when someone moves out. If they move out, we go through the apartments and we would replace it with what we have in stock. Okay. If they request one, then they come and pick one up or we deliver it to their apartment. And I assume then at some point you have to order new fire extinguishers, is that correct? Correct. You don't just have like an unlimited supply? Normally we keep uh, 12 in stock at our warehouse at all times. If we do have to order them, we get those out of Denver, Colorado. Okay. 
And the one that you gave Detective Brantner on, I believe it was the 30th, that was a brand new fire extinguisher that hadn't been used, is that correct? Right, still okay. in the box. And have you noticed that sometimes when you get a new shipment of fire extinguishers, the labels are updated? Yes. Thank you. No further questions. Cross-examination. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Kimmel, you uh, met with Officer Brantner on July 30th of 2008. Is that sound right to you? Correct. Okay. And that was the day that you gave him the sample fire extinguisher, which was People's Exhibit 84? Correct. Okay. And that was the brand new fire extinguisher, correct? Yes. Okay. And that one was, um, I assume, uh, charged or ready to use? Yes. Okay. And when you met with Officer Brantner on July 30th, uh, you, you and Officer Brantner both went into the apartment? No, I met him out on the front sidewalk of the building. Okay, you didn't go inside at no. all? No. Okay. But you knew that between July 17th, um, the date approximately that Justin died, and July 30th, other people had been inside that apartment? Correct. Okay, and those were uh, some of friends of Justin Zapata who had been in there to clean out the apartment? Yes. Okay. And you, your company installs fire extinguishers in all of the apartments that you rent, is that right? Correct. Do you personally install them? I have, yes. Okay, did you personally install every fire extinguisher in every apartment? No. Okay, and so other people install the fire extinguishers into the apartments? Yes. And um, you don't go into an apartment daily to check and make sure there's a fire extinguisher in there, do you? No. Okay. So you only know if one's missing if somebody calls you and, and tells you or asks for one? Correct. All right. Um, may I approach yes. the exhibits? Mr. Kimmel, I'm going to hand you what's been admitted as people's number 86 and also people's number 84. 84. And 84, people's number 84 is the new fire extinguisher that you, is the one that you handed to Officer Brantner, correct? This one, yes. Yes. Um, and that, can you tell from looking at the fire extinguishers how much each of them weigh? Is that information you can find on the fire extinguisher? Uh, approximate weight, I don't know. Okay. If you were uh, to, if you were to look at the label on the fire extinguisher, does it show the weight? Can you see that anymore? Uh, three pounds. Okay, and you're, can you tell me, are you looking at people's number 84 right now? 84, yes. Okay, and that one states that the minimum weight is how much? Three pounds. Okay, and the maximum, is there a maximum weight on there as well? Three pounds. It says three pounds, uh, 12 ounces. Okay, and then on people's 86, can you see the weight on that one as well? And the minimum weight? Gross weight is three pounds. Um, maximum weight is three pounds, five ounces. Okay, so the two fire extinguishers are not exactly the same. They have different weights. Correct. Okay. May I approach the witness? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. I have no further questions. Any redirect? No, thank you, Matt. Thank you. Welcome, Seth. I appreciate your time. <laughs> thank you.
Once you're settled in, if you can introduce yourself to the jury by stating your name and spelling your last name. My name is Scott Barber, B-A-R-B-E-R. Uh, -E Thank you. You may examine. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, good morning. Can you tell the jury how you're currently employed? I'm currently employed as an investigator with the Greeley Police Department. And how long have you been an investigator there? Uh, see her on and off for approximately eight years. Okay. <clears throat> And were you a detective in July of last year? Yes, I was. <laughs> were you working on July 17th of 2008? Yes. And can you tell the jury a little bit about um, your involvement in this investigation, if you had any? Yeah, I uh, assisted in the investigation with uh, interviewing uh, witnesses uh, that had come into the uh, police station that afternoon. Okay, do you remember anyone specifically you interviewed that day? I interviewed uh, Stephanie Zapata, Rochelle Camacho, Miranda Martinez, and uh, uh, Maria uh, Zapata. <laughs> and these were all at the Greeley Police Department? Yes. All right. I want to talk to you specifically about um, Stephanie Zapata. Can you tell the jury um, if during the course of your interview if you observed her cell phone? Yes, I did. And can you tell the jury what you observed on her cell phone? Uh, Stephanie Zapata was uh, uh, checking her cell phone to find out uh, when the last call uh, or text message she received from Angie was. And uh, basically, uh, uh, she uh, allowed me to view a text message she received from Angie on um, uh, July 16th at about uh, 9, uh, 40 hours the, in the evening. Okay. And did, did you, in fact, observe that? Yes, I did. With, the, with that time frame on it? Yes. Okay. And it sounds like you um, interviewed many of the family members and friends of the victim? Uh, yes. And, and can you describe uh, their, their demeanor as you spoke to them? Um, primarily, they were they were obviously upset, but uh, for the most part, were able to maintain enough composure to uh, talk to me about uh, you know what they knew, and they were definitely willing to uh, uh, try and help out wherever they could. I have one moment. <clears throat> Cross-examination. You. you stated that you interviewed several different people. One of those people was Maria Zapata, is that right? Yes. Okay, and she was Justin, she's Justin Zapata's mother? That's correct. Okay, and you interviewed her on July 17th, 2008 as well, correct? Yes. Okay, and she had told you that um, she doesn't know, um, Justin especially doesn't tell her what he's doing or who he's hanging out with because he knows it upsets her. I can recall him in my own case. Apparently that spot's being requested, so I'm going to sustain, I'm going to at this point sustain the objection. Judge, I would just argue that he did, Mr. Miller did ask Officer Barber if he did interview Maria Zapata, so I, I think this is still within the scope of that. Really? I guess in, 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 in preventing Mr. Barber from being recalled, I will let her ask something she would ask him on. So you're welcome to proceed pursuant to Rule 607. Thank you. Do you want me to repeat that? Uh, yeah, please. Okay. <laughs> um, when you interviewed Maria Zapata on July 17th, she told you that um, Justin especially does not tell her what he was doing or who he was hanging out with because he knew it upsets her. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. I have nothing further. Anything else, Mr. Miller? And again, you testified as far as uh, the demeanor of these family members um, when you were interviewing them. Can you describe Ms. Zapata, Maria Zapata's? Uh, yes. Um, let me clarify. Uh, 
Maria Zapata is, she has a lot of animosity towards police. She was upset about Angie or Justin's death, but she still unfortunately has a lot of animosity towards police and obviously didn't want to be there talking to me. Any free calls? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay, thank you. You're welcome to step down. Just watch your step. We appreciate your time. And once you're settled in, if you can introduce yourself to the jury by stating your name, and if you wouldn't mind spelling your first and last name for the court reporter. Madden Gautam. I spell uh, M-A-D-A-N. Last name G-A-U-T-A-M. I work for Harris Discount Liquor. Three. Oh, sorry, what uh, Harris Discount Liquor on the east side of Grady. Thank you. You may examine. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> and I'm sorry, you said you work for Harry's Discount Liquor? That's right. And what do you do for, for the liquor store? Well, I work as a clerk and I'm assistant manager too. Is the manager? Yeah, that's right. Okay. And how long have you been doing that? For a year and a half. So you were working there during the month of July of last year? Yeah, I was. And as a manager, are you familiar with uh, the surveillance system? Pretty much, yeah. Okay, do you help run that? Yes, I do. And during the entire month of July, was it functioning properly? Yep. Yeah. Okay. And you, um, at some point, talked to law enforcement about this case, is that correct? That's right, yeah. All right. And did you also tell him that you knew uh, who Angie Zapata was? She used to come there quite often, yeah. Okay. And did you know the vehicle she drove? Yes, I do. Okay. And how did you know that? Well, she comes, she's a regular customer. She comes there quite often. And uh, so I happened to notice the car, customers drive and pay attention on those things. So. Okay. And um, so you told police about this when you talked to them? Mm-hmm. Yes, I did. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? Yes. Handing you what's been marked as People's Exhibit 95. Do you recognize that? I do. And how do you recognize that? Uh, is my signature in it. Okay. And have you reviewed that? Yes, I did. And can you tell the jury what that that is? It's the surveillance video of my store when uh, uh, the person uh, walked in to buy beer. Okay. And is, is it a fair and accurate picture of your liquor store and the surveillance system contained there? Definitely, yeah. Okay. Your Honor, this time I move to admit and publish People's 95. Any objection? No objection. And People's 95 is received into evidence. You're welcome to publish if you wish. And if I just may ask one more question sure. before publishing. Um, the timestamp on the on the video, uh, did you determine if that was correct or was it an hour off? It has to be an hour off. Yeah, I talked uh, about that with the uh, officer mm -hmm. as well that time. So it has to be an hour off. So it was an hour earlier than the time actually was? Uh, I th I don't remember it's an hour later or earlier, but it is an hour off. Okay. It has to be a... You know, this time I'd like to publish it. It might be better uh, to see it if we could have the lights down. Okay. Just give us an idea of how long the... There's... Oh. And is there any audio on your surveillance tape? No, you know, just a video. Okay. It's only like, I think, three minutes. Okay, let's turn the lights off for that three minutes so we can see it better.
Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> now, just to back up and ask you some more, uh, a few more questions about mm -hmm. that. Uh, when you testified earlier, you said you recognized uh, the car that Angie drove? Yes. And how did you recognize it? Oh, well, uh, there's only two persons who used to drive. We used to, two customers used to uh, have PD Cruiser, used to come there. And there's one is Angie, and the other one is uh, a friend of mine I used to know. And uh, they both used to drive green PD Cruiser. So, and, and Angie used to drive one of the green PD Cruisers. And just to clarify, would she buy alcohol or would someone else, would she drive someone else there to purchase alcohol? She so used to have all bunch of friends, yeah, uh, at the time. And is it uh, your store's policy to follow the state law and not sell alcohol to anyone under the influence? That's right. And Angie, I remember, she used to buy cigarettes, but then, so she was a cigarette customer. Okay. And does everyone that works at the liquor store know not to sell to someone under the influence of alcohol? Objection, speculation. Please don't answer that. I'm going to sustain the objection. Is it is it the policy of the anyone that works at that yeah, store? Yeah, that's the policy of our store. <laughs> Thank you. Cross-examination. I don't have any questions for this one. Thank you, sir. You're welcome to step down. Appreciate your time. Have a good Thank day. You. Next witness. And sir, once you're settled in, if you can introduce yourself to this jury by stating your name and spelling your last name. Good morning. My name is Trevor Anderson. My last name is spelled A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. Can you please tell the jury how you're currently employed? Uh, right now, I'm a detective for the Greeley Police Department. I've had that uh, position since 2004. I started with them as an officer in 2001. And what is your current assignment? I'm the uh, computer crimes investigator. I'm currently assigned to the crime lab. <clears throat> and I spend most of my time uh, doing forensic examinations on computers, cell phones, and video. And do you have any specialized training in that area? Yes, I do. Uh, I've had uh, attended about 500 hours of training uh, covering all of those topics. What specifically uh, have you had training in regarding cell phones? Uh, cell phones, uh, I've had several classes uh, dealing with different ways to preserve and recover uh, electronic evidence, uh, things that might be found on a cell phone uh, so that uh, it can be looked at and be determined if it's evidence or not. And is that what you spend most of your time doing at this point as a, as a police officer? Yes. Have you been qualified as an ex expert before in this area? Yes, I have. And how many times? Uh, for the area of computer forensics, which would include cell phones, uh, I've been qualified one time. Uh, that was in August of 2007 uh, in this courtroom. You know, at this time I moved to qualify De Detective Anderson as an expert in electronic data recovery regarding computers, including cell phones. No objection. And so the court, pursuant to Rule 702 of the Rules of Evidence, is going to find that Investigator Anderson, based on his knowledge, skill, experience, training, and education, is an expert in the field of computer forensics and electronic data recovery, and uh, may testify and offer opinion an opinion with regard to that uh, subject matter. Thank you. <clears throat> Before we get into that uh, portion of this investigation, on July 17th, were you uh, called to assist in this investigation? Yes, I was. And what, what did you do? 
uh, one of my collateral assignments is to uh, investigate and to assist with major crime scenes that would be lengthy or complicated. On that day, I was asked to uh, to uh, respond to the scene of a death to, to help other investigators with that scene and the physical evidence. And did you have any specific assignments when you were there? Yes, uh, in the area of the apartment, uh, I was asked to uh, shoot video of the crime scene. And then I also uh, measured and made uh, crime scene drawings. Uh, and then there, there were a couple of, uh, of other things I did that were relatively minor, uh, assisting the other uh, investigators in more of a general way. And ultimately, did you assist Detective Buckingham in, in the overall uh, booking in of evidence and things like that? Yes, I did. And there was never a fire extinguisher sound found at the apartment? No. After uh, assisting at the crime scene, did you uh, look at anything else on July, July 17th? Yes. Uh, during the investigation at the crime scene, two cell phones were located. Uh, in a backpack in the bedroom closet uh, in the late hours of the 17th, uh, I was told that Investigator Tharp had obtained a search warrant so that we might look at those phones. And uh, at the police department, I began examination of those two phones that we found. And these are from the victim's apartment? Correct. What were the results? What, what did you find out about these particular phones? Uh, there were two cell phones. Uh, the first one, uh, I should say neither cell phone uh, had any power in its battery when we found them. Uh, one of the cell phones I was able to attach to a charger and we got enough electricity flowing so that we could turn it on and take a look at it. Uh, it only took a few minutes of looking to find out that the last time that that cell phone was used was April 2nd of 2008. Uh, the other cell phone I was unable to power on. Uh, sometime later, I took that cell phone to one of the cricket stores in Greeley, and I spoke with the manager there. Uh, Sheen loaned me a brand new battery and a new charger, and at that time I was able to get the cell phone to turn on, but somehow the screen had been damaged and I couldn't see anything that was displayed. So did these appear to be two older phones no longer in service? Yes. After looking at looking through these two phones, um, July 17th, and, and the follow-up you did on that, I want to talk about July 29th. Um, what did you do on that date? Uh, July 29th, uh, I was asked to drive to Westminster to an everyday convenience store. Okay. And what was your purpose there? Uh, one of the other investigators was uh, following up on leads. Uh, that the defendant may have used a, a credit card uh, in different places in, in the greater Denver area. This was one of those places. And I was asked to try and recover the video from that store. Okay. And then moving on to July 30th, did you also respond to the uh, Denver area? Yes. And what did you do that day? Uh, visited several other gas stations and convenience stores in Lakewood. With regard to July 29th, when you went to help with the surveillance video, what did you do? What, what did you do to help out? Uh, so, uh, as part of my computer forensic training, I also have occasion to work with digital video systems a lot. That's why they called me. Uh, this store had a digital video system, and uh, it was my job to figure out how to preserve the video that was on there. Uh, Sometimes that's a difficult task. In this case, it was just a, a long process of having that machine copy the video that it contained out to DVDs. And was that done in this case? It was done. And did you review those videos or did another officer? I did not review them. Okay. And getting back to July 30th, um, when you responded to Lakewood, Colorado, did you um, receive register tape? Did you testify to that? Or did you talk to a manager there? Yes. Okay, and what happened then? Uh, there was a store on 13th Avenue, I believe it was a Western Convenience. Uh, I had been given a list of possible transactions uh, from other investigators, and I was asked uh, if I could find uh, 
video surveillance of those transactions and any record of the transaction, a register tape or some other kind of business record. Uh, and at that store, I found both. Okay. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? Yes. I'm handing you what's been marked as People's Exhibit 90. Do you recognize that? Uh, yes, I do. And what is it? That's a uh, register tape that uh, was given to me by the manager at the Western Convenience on 13th Avenue in Lakewood. And it's rolled up in, a, I guess, a different way from being completely rolled up. There's two separate rolls. Is, did you book that in like that? Yes, I did. And can you tell the jury why you did? Uh, <clears throat> at this particular store, I was asked to attempt to locate a record of a transaction that would have happened on... Uh, July 27th at 1919 or 719 p.m. Uh, for the time and the manager allowed me to look through these his, his register tapes and I found that transaction okay and, and, and can you see it by the way you have the the register tape rolled up there yes I can and is that the transaction? Did, well, did you reconcile that with the bank statement or the information you had and compare the register tape? Uh, the information listed on this transaction uh, matches what I was asked to find by other investigators. And, and who were you asked to look for this by? Uh, it was Detective Lobato. Okay. Your Honor, this time I move to admit People's 90. No objection. People's 90 is received into evidence. Thank you. Welcome to publish it. Before I publish, I might ask a few more questions. Which transaction um, on there is the one that you you found to be from Monica Murguia's debit card? Uh, the the way that the transaction on the tape is laid out was explained to me, and the uh, it start out starts off with register number one. Uh, it gives a date and a time, which here is July. 28th, oh, sorry, July 27th at uh, 19, 19 hours. Uh, it shows that uh, uh, pump, gas pump, presumably number one, was pre-authorized for $100. And then the last line of the transaction gives the four, uh, last four digits of a credit card number. And what's the total for that? Uh, there is no total listed for the entire transaction. So it's just a pre-approval for $100? Correct. All right. May I approach? Yes. Thank you. Detective Anderson, I want to talk a little bit now about August 14th. Um, do you recall if you were asked to do anything in relation to this case that day? Yes. And what was that? Uh, began an examination of a cell phone. Okay. And were you aware of what or whose cell phone it was? Uh, the When I received the cell phone uh, on the packaging, it was written uh, that it was the suspect's cell phone. Okay. So uh, can you tell the jury what you did to analyze that cell phone? This examination of the cell phone went like most. Uh, cell phones are difficult because there's thousands of different models and brands, and they're all differently programmed. They have different capabilities. Uh, and our preferred method of examining them is to do it electronically. And the reason for that is because we might have five or 10,000 pages of information that could come out of a cell phone. Uh, oftentimes, though, the software that's available won't be able to look at all the different things that might be in the cell phone. Uh, we might be able to look at the contact list and some photographs electronically, but say text messages not. And so in that case, uh, we would take photographs of the phone's display. And, and that's what happened in this case. Uh, I, had, I examined the phone a couple of different ways electronically, and then some information I had to take photographs of. And were you able to 
uh, capture some photographs that were saved into the cell phone? Yes, uh, photographs on the cell phone were, were downloaded electronically and they were uh, saved to uh, a CD and placed into evidence. During uh, the analysis of the uh, cell phone itself, do you also determine if any websites have been visited by uh, a particular defendant or anything like that? Yes. Um, and let me just ask you, did it appear he had visited any spaces that are social networking? Yes. And which one in particular? Moco space. Okay. And how could you tell that? The uh, part of the cell phone's memory, the data that was stored on it, include uh, pieces of web pages that included the web address Moco Space. Okay. Now, getting back to the photos, would you recognize those photos if you saw them? Yes. Your Honor, may I approach the witness? Handing you what's been marked People's Exhibit 50 through 54 inclusive, if you could take a look at those. And do you recognize those? Yes, I do. And what are they? These are some of the photos that were collected from that cell phone. Okay. So those five photos were taken off the cell phone? Yes. And are they fair and accurate copies of the images you found on the cell phone? Yes. You know, this time I move to admit people's 50 through 54 inclusive. Um, judge, I would object to, can you see? Sure. I think 50 and 51. <coughs> May we approach? Yes. And so the court's going to overrule the objection. People's 50 through 54 inclusive are received in evidence. Thank you, Your Honor. Detective Anderson, when you uh, pull these photos off uh, of the cell phone, so to speak, um, or review the images, um, do you do a finding CD and document them more, more thoroughly than just the photo itself? Yes, all of the, uh, the evidence that I obtained from a cell phone and an explanation of, of how I got it and if I know the uh, relevance uh, goes on to a single CD or DVD and that's placed into evidence. And as to the photos I previously showed you, uh, did a date associated with, with e each of those photos, was that also done as part of your analysis? Yes, each uh, photograph uh, had a file name, uh, different file name for each photo. Uh, that file name was a series of numbers uh, that's consistent with a, a time and a date. Okay, and, and if we could publish People's 50, Do you have a, uh, when you did your findings on this particular photo, do you know the date and time of this photo? Uh, it would be on the finding CD, I don't remember it. Okay, and do you have any of those with you today? I do have the finding CD for this exam, yes. Okay, um, if it would help you to refresh your recollection to review that for this yes. photo? I would need a computer. Oh, you'd have to, you don't have it printed out? No. Did you provide the findings uh, CD to anyone else? Yes, I uh, gave a copy to uh, other detectives and also a copy was placed into evidence. Okay. If we could show 51. And 54. You can take that. On your August um, 14th review of the cell phone, did you also look through the contact sheet on that date? Yes. And did you find anything relative to the victim's phone number in this case? Initially, no. If I may approach the witness. Sure. I'm handing you copies of your uh, finding CD. Would you recognize those if you saw them? Yes. Okay. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? Yes. And 
is the date uh, that you're referring to being associated with these calls? Well, let me ask you this first. Are people's 50 through 54 included in those? Yes. And as far as people's 50 goes, if we could put that back up, so Detective Anderson. Are you able to see people's 50 on the screen? Yes. And the photo from your finding CD, does that contain a date This photo for this photo? Yes, it does. And what is that? Uh, in the file name for that picture, uh, it's all numbers, but the numbers are 06-2508, that's consistent with a date, and then the last four digits are 0913, a time, 913 in the, mo in the morning. Uh, the last three letters are JPG, that's the format for what type of photograph it is. And based on your expertise as far as uh, recovery of this type of evidence goes, is that commonplace for that to be the title of these things? I've seen photographs named like this many times. Okay. And if we could go to People's 51, is there a date associated with that photo as well? It is. And what is that? It's 7-1 uh, of 08 at 1447 hours. And if we could go to people's, I believe, 52. Do you have a date associated with that photo? Yes, it's uh, 718 of 08 at 1916 hours. Okay. And if we could go to people's 53. Is there a date associated with that one? Yes, it's 727 of 08 at 2127 hours. And if we could go to People's 54. Do you have a date associated with that? Yes, it's uh, 7-3 of 08 at 1441 hours. Which would that be 2.41 p.m.? Correct. Thank you. May I approach a witness, Your Honor? People's 87. Do you recognize that? Yes, uh, this is the cell phone that I examined that we've been speaking about. Okay, and how do you know that that's the same cell phone? The, uh, my initials appear on the original packaging. Uh, I recognize the, the blue cover on the cell phone. And, and does it in fact match the phone seen in, in the photos we that you pulled off of this, People's Exhibits 50 through 51 and 52? Yes, in, in one of the photos we just looked at, uh, there's a cell phone being held and it looks just like this one. Thank you. No further questions. Any cross examination? Detective Anderson, you um, earlier testified that you had helped process the apartment, um, the scene of, of of this crime? Yes. Okay. And part of your work in doing that was helping to um, dust for prints and, and take prints? Correct. Okay. And you actually were able to lift some prints from the apartment? Yes. Okay. Specifically from a window? Yes. Okay. And that window was in the living room? Yeah, it was the, uh, the inside left portion of the living room window as you'd be looking at it from inside. Okay. And you lifted five prints? Correct. From that? Okay. Um, also, in your um, work on this case, did you view um, a surveillance video from uh, taken from a liquor store? Yes, I did. Okay. And when you are looking at, um, for example, pictures or videos, um, do you check ever to make see what the if the date and time are correct? The date and time stamp on the pictures or the video are correct? Yes. And how do you usually do that? 
Uh, Say with a video, for example. Uh, the video from the liquor store, uh, at the store, I was able to view live video playing on their monitor. On that monitor was a, a date and time. And I'll compare that date and time to what the real time is. And usually I use a cell phone for that. Okay. And with the liquor store video, um, that was from Harry's Discount Liquor, is that right? Yes. Okay. And were you able, you were able to determine that the time stamp on that um, liquor store video was in fact off. Yes. It's not correct. And it was actually an hour slow? Correct. Okay. And so if the video, the timestamp on the liquor store video stated it was 6.30 p.m., um, what would the actual time have been? 7.30 p.m. Okay. Thank you. I have no further questions. Can you redirect? Nothing from the people, Your Honor. Thank you. You're welcome to step down. Appreciate your time. Thank you. And if you can please introduce yourself to the jury by stating your name and spelling your last name. My name is Shanna Tollefson, T-O-L-L-E-F-S-O-N. Thank you. You may examine. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, good morning, Ms. Tollefson. Hi. Can you tell the jury how you're employed? I'm um, the senior court clerk at the municipal court in Greeley. <coughs> and what are your duties as senior court clerk? Um, I mainly work in the courtroom and in our, the dispositions in the... Um, everything that the judge orders, I enter that into the computer. And so this is for uh, the City of Greeley Municipal Court for tra traffic tickets and stuff like that? Yes. And so your job would be similar to the clerk you see seated by the judge up there? Similar, yes. Okay. Um, and how long had you been, have you been senior court clerk? Um, about a year and a half I've been senior court clerk. Okay. Um, I want to talk to you about July 15th. Do you recall that date? Yes. And do you recall a person by the name of uh, Justin Zapata appearing in your courtroom? I do. And do you know Justin Zapata as Angie Zapata? I know that that's what she went by, yeah. Okay. But did, what, are the court, what are the court records have her as? As Justin. Okay. And how do you uh, remember Mr. Zapata coming to court? What do you mean? Had he been to court before? Yes. Okay. And, and, and excuse me, she'd been to court before? Yes, she had. And how many times before July 15th would you say? Um, I'm not sure on the exact number, but I can think of a couple for sure. Okay. And this time when she came to court on the 15th, did you notice anything different about who was with her? Um, yes, she was with the male, and the um, reason it sticks out is normally when she would come in, if she had anybody, it was a female. Okay. And are you aware of who the females were she was usually with in court? I don't know specifically, no. Okay. And were you present when her case was called up? Yes. Where were you? I was sitting next to the judge. Was this male in the courtroom with her when she was called up? Yes. And if you're looking at the courtroom, how, uh, where were they seated, if you remember? As, as far as I can remember, I would say on the right side of the courtroom, the, as I'm facing the courtroom. And the type of, uh, I guess, court appearance it was, is this a, a set time where a number of cases are called all at once, or can you describe that for the jury? Um, yes, people are usually scheduled around the same time, and then, but they're staggered so that everyone doesn't come in at once. Um, and the judge usually sets them around 8.30ish. And their case can be called any time after 8.30? Right. Are they called in random order? For when the case is ready or when the judge is ready? Um, it's first come, first serve. So when they come in, it depends. They talk to the city attorney and then the judge. Okay. And you testified you remembered a, a male being with Angie that day. Um, and, and, but you were unable to give a description. Is right. that correct? Okay. Your Honor, if I may approach the witness. Sure. I'm handing you what's been marked as People's 96. Do you recognize that? I do. And how do you recognize that? Um, this is the recording of that court hearing. And is that how um, your is that how the court keeps transcripts or records of what, what what occurs there? Yes. Okay. So it's an actual is it an actual copy of a court record? Right. And have you listened to that? I have. And how do you know that? 
um, uh, through the, the recorder, we can listen to the different court hearings, and I remember hearing it. Okay, and did you initial that? I did. Okay, and do, do you recall on July 15th um, what time Angie Zapata appeared in court? Um, I had entered into the system, the computer system, around 9.47 in the morning. Okay. And getting back to the recording, is that is that a fair and accurate copy of what transpired in court that day? Yes. Your Honor, this time I move to admit and publish People's 96. No objection. People's 96 is received into evidence. You're welcome to publish. And it's an audio, Your Honor. I don't know if the, the court has a master volume there, so. <clears throat> Are due on the 17th? Is that so? Mm -hmm. That's, I don't know why they brought me here. I already set up my payment plans and everything. Say again? I don't know why they brought me. I, I already set up this my payment plans. This is just the bond return date. Is that? Okay, so you've already set up a payment plan? Mm -hmm. Did you do that this morning or you did it? No, day? I did it when I got out. And you have a stay until the 17th, is that when your first payment's due? Yeah. Okay, you'll be able to make your payment that day? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for appearing. City of Greeley calls Shanette. Just a couple follow-up questions. Um, is the recording um, done through a microphone by the judge? Mm -hmm. Um, yes, there's microphones at the podium, and there's a we have a recording. And when that uh, recording said the people or the city of Greeley versus Justin Zapata, was that aired throughout the courtroom? Right. Yes. So are there speakers in the back of the courtroom where everyone can hear what the judge is saying? I don't know about speakers, but it's a small enough everyone can hear. Yeah. Okay. And he does. She does speak into a microphone. Okay. Let me have one moment. Sure. And just to follow up, this was, uh, what kind of case was this against Angie Zapata? Traffic. Is a traffic ticket? Mm -hmm. And all the appearances you've talked about of that been for the same ticket? Yes. No further questions. Thank you, cross-examination. Ms. Tollefson, the day of um, that court appearance, you were sitting inside the courtroom the entire time, is that right? Okay, so you didn't see Justin Zapata out in the hallway or outside of the courtroom? No. Okay, you didn't see him come into the courthouse? No. Okay. <clears throat> you were familiar with Mr. Zapata through his court appearances? Yes. Okay, and you first learned about him actually from coworkers because they pointed, you, pointed him out to you because he was a male who dressed like a female, is that Correct. right? Um, you um, first talked to, you just, you talked to Detective Tharp about this case, correct? I did. That was on March 13th, 2009? Mm -hmm. Just a few weeks ago, is that right? You need to answer out yes, loud. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, and what your conversation was with Detective Tharp on the 13th was about this court appearance in July of 2008. Correct. So that court appearance was about eight months, eight months ago. Correct. Does that seem right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Between that July court appearance and March 13th, you had never contacted police at all regarding this case? No. Okay. <clears throat> You testified that you could not um, 
give any description of this person who was in court, sitting in the courtroom with Mr. Zapata. Correct. You've seen a lot of media coverage about this case? Off and on, yes. Okay. And when, because you were familiar with Mr. Zapata through his court appearance when this case first happened, did you pay attention to it? Um, off and on, yeah. Okay. But you had seen some media? A little bit, yeah. Okay. Do you recall how many people uh, were scheduled for court that morning of July 15th? No, I don't. Okay. Do you, is it, is there an average number that are scheduled on days like that? Um, I wouldn't, I would say probably between 50 and 100. Okay. -ish. So usually it's somewhere between 50 and 100 people on a regular sort of docket day like right. that? Okay, and those court appearances go from 8.30 in the morning until 11 a.m.? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so in that um, two and a half hour period, roughly 50 to 100 people go through the court process. Yes. Okay, and Justin, you testified Justin Zapata's case was not called until 9.47? Right. Okay, <clears throat> so a number of cases have been called before his, yes. and that morning the docket started at 8.30? Yes. Okay. There's also, in the courtroom, um, there is video surveillance as well, is that correct? Not in the courtroom, no. Okay, in the courthouse? Not, there's for money transactions at the windows, yes. Okay. I wouldn't say surveillance, though. If I may have a moment. You have nothing further. Thank you, nothing from the people, Your Honor. Thank you. You're welcome to step down. Appreciate your time. Good morning. My name is Mark Stump. Spelling of my last name is S T U M P F. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Good morning, Detective. Could you uh, tell the jury what your current assignment is? I am currently assigned to the Investigations Division of the Greeley Police Department. And are you assigned a specialty at this point? At this current time, I'm assigned to the Property Crimes Unit, um, as well as to uh, enforcing liquor laws. Um, and how long have you been a detective with the Greeley Police Department? I've been a, a detective with the Greeley Police Department since November of 2005. I want to talk to you about July 17th of 2008. Do you recall that date? Yes, sir. And did you have any duties as it relates to being a detective on that date? On that date, I would have conducted an initial interview with Ashley Rafino. And is that, does she also go by Ashley Zapata? I believe that's correct. And where was that interview conducted? That was conducted at the Greeley Police Department. And do you know what her relationship was to the victim or the family in this case? Ashley Rafino would have been the sister to the victim. Can you describe the jury, to the jury, her demeanor at the time of your interview? During the time of my interview, um, Ashley was, emo was emotionally upset. She was distraught. Um, oftentimes, she would break down crying. Okay. Did you interview anyone else uh, with relation to this case on July 17th? No, I did not. Were you asked to do any follow-up on July 28th in this case? Yes, I was. And can you tell the jury what, what that was? On July 28th, I was contacted by my direct uh, supervisor, Investigation Sergeant Steve Black. I was asked to conduct follow-up on some uh, debit card use that had been occurring in the Denver, Denver metro area, um, reference to a debit card belonging to Monica Mergia, who I learned through the investigation was also the victim's sister. Um, I was informed that the debit card had been in the uh, missing and unaccounted for PT Cruiser and was subsequently beginning to be used in the Denver metro area. 
Can you can you tell the jury what you did to start investigating this information you were provided by Sergeant Black? On July 28th, I initially made contact with Monica Morgia over the phone, um, informing her that I was going to be looking into the use of her debit card. Um, I arranged to meet with her later that evening. I also proceeded to make contact with Academy Bank, the bank where she banks, and made contact with a branch manager by the name of Elena Edstrom. And why were you making contact with uh, members from people from the bank? I was trying to obtain additional information about locations, times, dollar amounts of the transactions. I was also attempting to obtain a bank statement to show these transactions. And did you receive a bank statement? Yes, I did. From whom? Initially, a bank statement had been faxed to the Greeley Police Department. I did provide that to Sergeant Steve Black. During my meeting with Monica Margia later that evening, she did provide me with a bank statement she had obtained herself. Your Honor, if I may approach. Sure. Can I approach a witness? Sure. Penny, you must been marked as People's Exhibit 75. Do you recognize that? Yes, sir, I do. And what is that? This will be a bank account statement for Monica Mergia from Academy Bank. <laughs> And let me ask you this, Did there's highlighter marks on that. Do you know who put those on there? Those were placed on there by Monica. And did you receive this from her and, and do the follow-up you've been describing? Yes, I did. Okay. And based on the information from there, did you do anything on the 28th of July? Yeah, based on the information contained on the statement, investigator Dennis Lobato and myself responded to the Denver metro area um, with very limited information. Um, when we responded down there, we were trying to find some video surveillance of you know who may be committing these uh, uh, debit card uses. Um, we we're also trying to find video surveillance and also any type of uh, receipts or transaction documentation. Thank you, Your Honor. May I approach the witness? Sure. Did you return to the uh, Denver area on July 29th? Yes, I did. Did you have more specific information about where these uh, transactions may be occurring? Yes, I did. Um, through the course of the investigation, um, I relied on assistance from a fraud specialist at the Greeley Police Department by the name of Christy Hardwick. Um, she, she would make contact with uh, corporate offices, banking institutions, and uh, she would relay information to me as it became available as far as where the transactions were occurring. Your Honor, may I approach the witness? Sure. Handing you what's been marked, People's 101, 102, and 103. Do you recognize those? Yes, sir, I do. And can you tell the jury what I've handed you? You've handed me uh, three copies of what are electronic receipts, reference to three transactions occurring at Federal Heights 66 at 9200 North Federal Boulevard in Denver, Colorado. And you said 66. Is that a Phillips 66? Yes, that's correct. And on July 29th, did you go to the Phillips 66? Yes, I did. What information did you receive um, uh, relevant to Ms. Merguia's statement there? I received, I was provided with uh, two store reports and a, a day shift report reference to the cre credit card transactions occurring at that location. Okay. And did you cross-reference what you observed uh, at the gas station with the bank statement you had from Ms. Merguia? Yes, I did. And what did you learn? The information contained on the store reports did match the information contained on the uh, bank account statement. And what I've handed you there, those aren't the day, sh day reports or the work reports that you just testified about? No, they are not. What are they? These are uh, electronic receipts, which I later obtained, obtaining on March 10th of this year. Um, the initial day reports and the shift reports were of poor quality and uh, they were kind of hard to decipher so I conducted some additional follow-up to get some more uh, detailed information. Your Honor, at this time I move to admit People's 101, 102, and 103. No objection, Your Honor. And People's 101, 2, and 3 are received into evidence.
Did you respond to a Western convenience store in Thornton, Colorado? Yes, I did. And what? why did you respond there? I responded to that location after I obtained information that uh, Monica's debit card had also been used at that location. What information did you receive about that when you arrived there? At that location, I obtained or I was allowed to look through uh, daily credit card reports. I did locate um, on a daily credit card report the, um, the transaction occurring at that location. And when you observed this transaction, were you able to take that copy or did you have to do something else? The store needed to maintain possession of that to continue with their daily uh, business. Um, I took cell phone photos of this receipt and uh, later emailed it to myself and uh, then provided them for the case investigation. And, with, and I don't know if you said this, but Ms. Merguia's full account number, you observed that being used at that location? Yes, the daily credit card report did show her full debit card number on their credit card report. And, I, and this was in Thornton, Colorado at a Western convenience? Yes, sir, that's correct. May I approach the witness, Your yes. Honor? I'm handing you what's been marked People's 45, 47, 48, and 49. Do you recognize those? Yes, I do. And, and can you tell the jury what, what those are? These are photographs of the uh, daily credit card report that I took from the Western Convenience in Thornton, which uh, show the dates, times, the uh, Monica's debit card number for the transaction occurring at that location. Are they fair and accurate photos of the receipts you observed? Yes, they are. Your Honor, at this time I move to admit 45, 47, 48, and 49. No objection. People's 45. 47, 48, 49 are received into evidence. If we could put 45 on this camera. And I don't know if you can see that, Detective. There's one by you as well. Okay. There's one right behind you as well. What is that a photo of? That is a photograph of what has been marked as exhibit number 45. It shows the last approximate half of Monica's debit card number, and it shows the dollar amount of the transaction, which also appears on her bank account statement. So when you took these photos, did you take half and half, or how did you do this? I initially tried to take a photograph of the entire thing. However, those photos were kind of blurry due to the, the closeness and the small uh, type on the receipt. So I, what I did was I split up my photographs to make it more clear and more easily uh, legible. And did, did that amount for $46.11 match Ms. Merguia's bank statement? Yes, it did. If we could have people's 47. And what is this a photo of? This would be a photograph of their closed daily report, <laughs> which shows um, the dates and times that the credit card uh, report was ran for. Okay. And People's 48. Is this the is this the first half of People's 45? Yes. People's 49. Is this how many transactions did you observe from Ms. Merguia's account at this gas station? At Thor that location, I only obtain information for one transaction. And I think I might have misstated it. Is People's 49 the first half of People's 45? Yes. Thank you. So that highlighted number there you cross-referenced with the bank statement you had? I was given the debit card number by Academy Bank. It doesn't appear on the bank statement itself, uh, but it does match the debit card number I was given from bank personnel. After you went to the Western Convenience Store in Thornton, uh, did you go to the Everyday Store in Westminster, Colorado? Yes, I did. And what did you learn when you arrived at that location? At that location, I was allowed to look through uh, 
um, a large register roll tape which showed uh, transactions occurring at the business. Um, I located information for two transactions occurring there on this register tape, both transactions showing the last four digits of Monica's debit card number. And what did you do when you uh, found that information? Like I had done at the uh, previous store, I took photographs of that information. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? Yes. I'm handing you West Bend Mark Peoples 46. Do you recognize that? Yes, I do. And what is it? This is a copy of the photograph I took from that everyday store in Westminster. May I approach again, Your Honor? I'm also handing you what's been marked as Peoples 92. Does that correspond to the same location? Yes, it does. And what is that? This is a cutout section of a receipt that I obtained from the Everyday Store reference to a denial occurring with that credit card on July 28th. Okay. And all these transactions from the Philip 66, the Western Convenience, and the Everyday Store, do they correlate with um, dates after Ms. Murguia's card was stolen? Yes. Okay. Did you respond to any other locations? Oops, let me back up. Are those fair and accurate <coughs> copies of the pictures you took? The, sorry, People's 46. Yeah, People 46 is a fair and accurate representation. This time I move to admit People's 46. 46 is received into evidence. You're welcome to publish. And did you draw the lines on here? I can't recall if I drew the lines or if the clerk who was assisting me had drawn those lines. And if you look up there, uh, you see the asterisk with the last uh, four digits, three, five, six, seven. Does that correlate with Ms. Merguia's debit card number? Yes, it does. Okay. And do the dates and times of these transactions, 727-08 um, at 2011, which I believe would be 811 p.m., correlate with her uh, account summary you received? Yeah, her, her account statement, the dates and times contained on it um, are dates and times which the transactions posted to the account, which is not necessarily the actual times of the transactions, uh, but from the information we obtained from Academy Bank, um, the information did match. Okay. Um, and People's 92, is that, a co is that the actual receipt you received from one of these transactions? Yes, it is. And is it in the same condition as last time you observed it? Yes, it is. Your Honor, this time I move to admit People's 92. Okay. People's 92 is received into evidence. Okay. <clears throat> On July 29th, did you respond to other locations, other gas stations? Yes, I did. And did you receive any other information specific to the accounts, bank account statement you had? I was unable to obtain any other uh, documentation or receipts from the other locations. Um, those other locations indicated that a lot of their credit card stuff is not stored on site or the, the uh, credit card or debit card information is grouped together by card type, therefore making it uh, impossible to actually locate any specific information. And you mentioned um you testified that, that you got receipts for all these transactions, and some of them say pay at the pump. Um, did it appear that most of the transactions occurred out at the pump instead of inside the store? That's correct. And, and did that have anything to do with your inability to get receipts at some places? Yes, I did. All right. You also mentioned that you and Detective Lobato had gone down there together, were you also, and you said you also were looking for surveillance. Um, having uh, well, let me ask you this. Were you able to uh, get any surveillance video? Yes, I believe in total we collected seven different uh, sources of video surveillance. And let me ask you this. When you were, went to these gas stations, did you look for cameras around the gas station when you arrived? Yes, I did. And did it appear there was surveillance on the outside pumps? Um, as we followed up on these transactions, 
I only recall remembering one location that had a camera mounted on the outside. Um, most of the locations did have cameras inside. And from my experience in training and dealing with uh, convenience stores or gas stations, oftentimes they uh, focus their surveillance on the inside of the store for uh, robberies or employee theft or stuff similar to that. Okay. So the surveillance, there was rarely, if any, surveillance on the outside pumps? That's correct. I may have one moment. Your Honor, Your Honor I have no further questions. Thank you. Cross examination. Good morning, Detective. Good morning, sir. <clears throat> Just going back real quick to the uh, uh, the video surveillance. Am I correct in saying that you, neither you nor Detective Lobato uh, found any video surveillance, any footage from any of these gas stations that was of any relevance for this case? Is that true? That's my understanding, yes. And you've talked a lot, you testified a lot about uh, receipts uh, that you and uh, Detective Lobato obtained. And see if I can phrase this in, a, in an easy way. Um, there's nothing about these receipts that indicates to you who actually made these purchases. Is that correct? That's correct. Your Honor, if I could have a moment. Sure. Thank you, Detective. I have no further questions. Thank you. Any redirect? Thank you. You want to step down. Appreciate your time. Quick question, am I excused from my subpoena? He's released, Your Honor. Yes, you are. Thank okay. you. If you wouldn't mind putting those documents right over here. I will. Thank you. Next witness, please. People call it Angie Tyree. <clears throat> Feel free to adjust that microphone if you like. Once you're settled in, if you can introduce yourself to the jury by stating your name and spelling your last name. My name's Angie. Tyree, T-Y-R-E-E. -E. Thank you. You may examine. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. Um, Ms. Tyree, where do you currently live? Off of 12825 Claremont Place, or Street. And was there a point in time when you lived um, at 9440 Hoffman Way? Yes. And when was that? That was about three weeks ago. So you moved out of there about yeah. three weeks ago? Mm -hmm. And prior to three weeks, how long had you lived there up to three weeks ago? Um, I believe about a year. All right. And were you living there in July of last year? Yes. And was Alan Andrade living there off and on during that yes. time frame? And can you tell the jury how you know Mr. Andrade? We were together. At the time, we weren't together. He was just staying with me, but we were together for about a year and a half, two years. When you say together, do you mean dating? Or? Yes. Okay. And when did you, uh, when did the two of you stop dating? At what time? Um, I don't remember. In July of 2008, how long had he been living at that apartment? say for about three months. And was he staying there every single night or was he there some nights and not other nights? Some nights was. And if you could tell the jury about that, how was he there two or three nights and then gone for two or three? No, it was maybe about a night in the week that he wasn't there. Okay. And if he did, he would come in late, around like 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock. And do you recall if he was there uh, on July 15th through the 17th? The 15th, he wasn't there, no. Okay. And was he gone for a few days after the 15th? No, he was only gone for a night. And do you recall talking to police about this incident on July 30th of 2008? Yes. And is that what you told the police that day? No. What did you tell the police that day? I don't remember. Okay. 
Do you remember telling him that the defendant commonly stayed at the apartment three to four nights a week and then was gone other nights? No. Do you remember further describing that as other nights when he was gone, he was out partying or staying with friends for a few days? Yes. this three months where he'd stay would he, so he would stay at your apartment off and on and be gone for three or four days at a time he would be there most of the week except for maybe one day and again you recall telling the officer you said he was only there three or four nights a week no I never Talking about that week involving July 15th, you said he was gone uh, for just that night? Mm -hmm. And you remember him being there the 16th? Yes. And you remember being interviewed by police on the 30th again? You testified that you remember Greg Tharp interviewing you? Yes. And you didn't tell him that that day? No. Let me ask you this, do you still have contact with Mr. Andrade? Yes. How often? Um, maybe once a week I'll get a letter. Did you talk to him on the phone? I haven't recently. Do you still have feelings for Mr. Andrade? Yes. What kind of feelings? Objection, relevance. It goes to, uh, the court's gonna uh, oral your objection, I believe, in trial. You can answer can the you, question. Can you repeat that again? What kind of feelings do you have for Mr. Andrade? I love him. And did you love him in July on July 30th of last year when you spoke to the police officers? Yes. So he was staying with you. You still had feelings for him, but you weren't dating at that time. Exactly. So is it safe to say you wanted something more at that time? Did I want something more? Yes. Yes. Did you know he was seeing other people at the time? No. Do you recall July 30th when the police showed up at the apartment and, and you spoke with them? They showed up. That, I, mem I remember when he ended up getting arrested, they talked to me. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I believe they showed up on the 31st, but I'm not too sure. Okay. And, and there was the, the PT cruiser parked out front of your apartment building there? When? On the 30th? Yes. So, yeah, yeah. And how long had Mr. Andrade had that PT cruiser? Let's say about a week. I would think, yeah, about a week or two. Then do you remember, did you say a week or two? A week or two. I think it was a week. I'm not too sure. And again, you recall talking to Detective Tharp about this case on July mm -hmm. 30th? Yes. And you told him he had had the uh, PT cruiser, he arrived at it with mid-July sometime? Yes. Does that sound right? Yes. Okay. What did he tell you with regard to the PT cruiser? Who? How he obtained it, Mr. Andrade? That he bought it from a friend. Did he tell you for how much? No. Do you remember him telling you he bought it from a friend for $3,100? No. Do you remember telling Detective Tharp that on July 30th, 2008? Yes. You did tell Detective Tharp that? Yes, I remember. Yes. Did the defendant uh, live for free at your house or did he help pay rent or anything like that? Um, I was paying for it. So he was he was living there for free? Yeah, he was supposed to get a job. He was looking. But he didn't have a job? No. <coughs> for any of those three months, did he have a job? Objection, Ralph. Sustained. 
so for those uh, from the middle of July when you saw the defendant arrive uh, with the PT cruiser, was he the only one that was driving it? Mm -hmm. Sorry, you have to say yes or no because yes, sorry, yes. You also talked to uh, Detective Tharp about observing any injuries on Mr. Andrade during the previous couple weeks. Did did you observe any injuries on him? For no. The, okay. And at the time, uh, you gave Detective Tharp Mr. Andrade's cell phone number. Do you recall that phone number? No, I don't remember it now. Would you remember it if I read it to you? Possibly. Do you remember telling him that this cell phone number was 720? I still don't remember the number. Okay. Um, did the defendant keep clothes at your house or have a closet or anything like that? Um, he had clothes, yeah. He didn't have his own closet. It was my closet. Okay. And you showed the detective that he had a few items of clothing there? Yes. On July 30th, um, you spoke to Detective Tharp a couple times. Do you remember that? When they came and searched the house. And did you speak to him at the police station? Yes, at the beginning, yes, okay. when they arrested him. Do you remember discussing a suspicious conversation you had had with the defendant? No. Okay. Do you remember telling Detective Tharp that about two to three weeks ago the defendant arrived in the PT Cruiser? Yes. And that he told you that he was in trouble and scared? Yes. Um, and that he needed to skip town? No. You don't recall telling Detective Tharp that? Mm -mm. Do you also recall recently talking to Detective Tharp in March of 2009? Yes. And you talked to him about the defendant seemed more edgy after, this, uh, after the date of this uh, offense? Yes. What did you mean by edgy? He was saying that he was going to kill himself. Okay. You said, well, I'm sorry, you, it wasn't like it or it was like? Yes. Why do you say that? Because he said he was going to kill himself. So he was upset and edgy? Yes. Okay. And that same day, uh, you told Detective Tharp that the defendant did lie to you about actually going to Greeley? That he lied to me about going to Greeley? No. You never told Detective Tharp in March of this year that the defendant did lie to you about going to Greeley? Repeat that question again. <clears throat> In March of 2009, when you spoke to Detective Tharp, you told him that the defendant did lie to you about him actually coming to Greeley. I don't remember saying that. Okay. You mentioned that you had spoken to him on jail calls. Do you recall uh, speaking to him several times after his arrest? Yes. All right. And specifically, uh, August 27th of 2008? I can't remember that day specifically. Your Honor, pursuant to our stipulation, I'd ask to admit and play uh, people's exhibit number. received into evidence by stipulation of the parties you may publish if you wish. And Your Honor, if I may, um, I'm going to wait for Ms. Holscher to get back here. I got to ask sure. about another piece of evidence. Your 
Honor, may I approach the witness? Yes. Ms. Tyree, I'm handing you what's been marked as People's Exhibit 76. Do you recognize that? Yes. And what is that? It's a letter I wrote to him. It's a letter you wrote to him, and do you remember when you wrote that to him approximately? I don't remember exact date. Approximately. I know it was the beginning of July, but I'm not too sure exactly what date. Okay, and, and what is that letter regarding? Regarding how I was getting treated okay. and how I was hurt because of the fact that he was messing with Felicia. Okay. And it described your feelings for him? Yeah. And are those feelings you have for him when you wrote that letter just as strong today as it was back then? Repeat that question again. When you wrote that letter, um, the feelings you had for Mr. Andrade, are they the same today as they were back then? No. And how have they changed? I don't know how they changed, just... I don't know, I'm not mad at him. Okay, so that was more when you were angry with him? Yes. Okay. So you loved him back then and as you love him today? Yeah. <clears throat> you know, this time I moved to the April 76 as it was just described by Miss Tyree and it was found in the PT cruiser. Objection, relevance, cumulative. The court's going to uh, sustain the objection. This is a, a good logical point to stop in this witness's testimony. Um, you'll understand why when you get back from lunch. And so we're going to take our lunch recess. I want to again instruct you that until the trial is completed, you must not discuss this case with anyone. That includes your family, people involved in the trial, other jurors, or anyone else. If someone approaches you and tries to discuss a trial with you, please let me know about it immediately. It is also important that you must not read or listen to any news reports of the trial and do not in any way try to gain information about this case outside of the courtroom. Uh, that includes no research on the internet, medical or law books, encyclopedias, dictionaries, or any other source. Finally, it is especially important that you not form or express any opinion on the case until it is finally submitted to you. I appreciate your hard work, and we'll see you. I have unrelated matters at uh, 1 o'clock and 1.15, so I believe we'll be able to get started at uh, one. 30. And so we'll see you at 1.30, okay? Thank you. If everybody can please rise for the jury. Okay, you're welcome to be seated. And are there any issues before we break for lunch? None from the people, Your Honor. Your Honor, I, um, I don't know if we want to do this now or later, but um, I anticipate this afternoon that a person from Moco Space is going to be testifying, and I do have... Um, an issue regarding that and I, an exhibit I think that the people are going to attempt to admit. Okay. I don't know if you want to. Did you want to talk about that now and I'll, I'll think about it over lunch hour? Sure. Um, Your Honor, may Ms. Tyree step down? Yes, Ms. Tyree, you're welcome oh. to step down. I would like you um, in the court at 1.30 today, okay? Understanding, based on what I've received from the people, that they're attempting to admit a number of pages, um, printouts from a mobile space account that um, belong to Justin Zapata. And really, my objection is to two pages of let's see, it's two pages of that. Um, there's. This has been marked as people's 
97A through II. And my objection is to pages 97HH and II, which appear to be a, a conversation between two people. Um, my objection is that it's hearsay and that there won't be a proper foundation um, to be laid. I, I don't know exactly how the people are trying to admit this, but that is my objection, and I wanted to raise it before we started with that witness. Thank you. Did you want to respond, Mr. Miller? Your Honor, I would point out to the court that this uh, is a certified, is a, the records provided to us under the search warrant or the uh, production of records request in this case, um, and it's the contents of her entire, of Angie's entire MoCo's base account. Uh, this hasn't been brought up before today. Defense counsel had this well before um, the trial date, and I don't, I don't think it's hearsay. It's offered as the records that they kept from her account that were still accessible. Okay, and what about the issue of, um, was there an authentication? Objection? You had a hearsay objection? And yes, there is, Judge. And I, I don't, I, in, first I did receive, I've had the MoCo Space records, of course, for a while, but I only about two weeks ago learned when I got an exhibit list that they were planning to introduce these. I think there's a hearsay objection. There's an 807 problem here that this is hearsay. There was never notice provided. We did have an 807 hearing earlier in the case on other matters. Um, this was not brought up in that in that case. As far as them being a business record, um, I don't think that they are a business record. Certainly not. I certainly understand that MoCo Space keeps some information as part of its in, in the ordinary course of its business that are business records. But I think and a hearsay conversation between two individuals, neither of whom are going to be testifying at the trial, does not fall under a business record um, type of exception. And so um, there's this conversation is allegedly between Justin Zapata and an unknown person. So we don't even know who the second person is. So it's anonymous hearsay. Um, the business records, um, I could actually just. Sure. While we're waiting, can I get a copy to review those documents? I'll make a copy of those mine or. This should. is the actual exhibit. Okay, so if I can hold on to this for now. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, that's all right. I'm sorry. Um, Your Honor, in um, the people, um, the Denver Department of Social Services, in the interest of RDH and PH, um, it's a case, uh, the citation is 944P2nd. 660. It's a Colorado Court of Appeals case from 1997. And in that case, the, um, the court um, wrote that statements by an outside party included within a business record are not necessarily granted the presumption of accuracy that attaches to statements made in the regular course of business because the outside party does not have a business duty to report the information. Um, however, records containing such information are in admissible when, as here, the information is provided as part of a business relationship between a business and an outsider, and there is evidence that the business substantially relied upon the information contained in the records. I didn't share the answer. But, I, but here we clearly have a conversation between um, two people. Um, one is alleged to be Mr. Zapata and the other is unknown. These are clearly not records that a business would use and rely upon. They have no um, interest in these records. This doesn't. This isn't the typical situation of a business record where a company is um, maintaining records for the purpose of um, their business. That isn't what's happening here. And so I don't think that um, these fall under the business record exception. Mr. Miller, is there anything you want to say? Your Honor, I would say, 
first of all that, that this is this company's business and these are their records they keep from it and what they produced when ordered to by the court. Second of all, um, I, I don't think it's hearsay uh, for that particular reason under the business records exception. I'd also uh, point to 807. I think it's clear um, that there is a, a reasonable amount of reason, many reasons why the court can uh, take these statements in, in conjunction with uh, how they're being made, where they're being made, they give it uh, the reliability afforded under 807. But I still think it falls under business records exceptions. This is the company's business, um, and, and at this point in time, that's what I'd leave it at. That's what we were attempting to get it in. I would note for the record that there are numerous pictures in there that I'm, I'm assuming Ms. Candelius wants to get in with comments posted by them as well. Um, so uh, I'd assume that, that um, those would fall under the same objection uh, Ms. Candelius has to these, these documents as well. Thank you. And so I will review these documents in their entirety and I'll make a ruling on that issue. I'll also read, what was the name of the case found at 944 P. Second 660? It was the um, people of the state of Colorado through the De Denver Department of Social Services in the interest of RDH and PH. Okay. And concerning KLH. Okay. So we'll see you at 1.30 today, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're back on the record. People versus Alan Andrade, 08CR 1319. I believe we left off with People's Exhibit 97, which is uh, some MoCo space communications between allegedly between the victim and various third parties. And I believe that the defense was objecting to the admission of 97HH and II, indicating that it is not a business record pursuant to people versus, excuse me, people in the interest of RDH, found at 944 P. Second 660, Colorado Court of Appeals case from 1997. So the court has reviewed People's Exhibit 97 as well as uh, the cited case. Is there anything else you want to say, Ms. Candelius? Judge, I would just also um, argue I, over the lunch hour is trying to look up a few things, but I think I would supplement, supplement my argument by stating that I think if that part, if those two specific parts of this exhibit come in, I do think that that um, opens the door to other evidence that the courts previously ruled inadmissible um, through J.J. Alejandro. Thank you. Mr. Miller? As to the last suggestion, I would disagree with that. Uh, pursuant to what we argued at the motions hearing and discussed at that, I don't think it is uh, opinion or reputation evidence and I think that it is admissible pursuant to 8036, um, and there's some case law that follows that discusses uh, computer records being admissible even in situations where they weren't even authenticated um, concerning uh, conversations um, that were held. This is a social networking site um, where they, uh, um, this is what the website's for, and this is stored contemporaneously with the conversations. I think you'll hear uh, testimony from uh, Mr. Rubio, who's a representative of uh, Moco Space. Uh, I disagree that it would open the door to anything we discussed in uh, the motions hearing before this case, um, because it's not proper under the rules of evidence. It's not even uh, close to that. It's it's a records that are kept. This records that are kept. In the course of business, it's not going to reputation for truthfulness or anything like that. Let me ask you this, because the language from the Court of Appeals in this published case is very much on point after they explain the exception, the hearsay exception through business records under Rule 803 sub 6. They go on to say, statements made by an outside party included within a business record are not necessarily granted the presumption of accuracy 
that attaches to statements made in the regular course of business because the outside party does not have a business duty to report the information. However, records containing such information are admissible when, as here, the information is provided as part of a business relationship between a business and an outsider, and there is evidence that the business substantially relied upon the information contained in the record. In the case that, that I'm reading about, um, we're dealing with certain um, evaluations that the business needed to rely on in order to run their business. So explain to me how a communication between the victim and a third party is how Moco Space substantially relied upon this information in their records. I can't make that connection. Well, and I think the, you know, I was reading the cases as well, and I'm assuming the court's looking at uh, Benham v. Prike, 703 P. 2nd, 644, and the other cases that follow. The, the case that they're citing is S-C-H-M-U-T-Z versus Bowles, and the case I'm referring to is the R-D-H case. Well, and I guess my argument would be that these cases are from 1990. And from the Bowles cases from 1990, um, before any of these sort of social networking sites were available, in order to communicate on these websites, one both both parties have to be members, um, and it is, this is what their business consists of, as far as uh, communications and meeting, uh, meeting other people, meeting and having discussions online. Um, I think that the law should have it developed since then. Um, I don't think this is talking about a business record um, that was for, I guess, a different type of business. I mean, this is what their business is, Your Honor. I, I guess I have no other way to put it. They, people communicate through there, and the communications are stored and saved. Okay. Do you have any cases at all on point in Colorado that deals with, because I'm not aware of any. And I somewhat disagree with you. It seems to me that a business can have certain business activity but not necessarily maintain business records of the product, in this case of the victim talking to several third parties. And I don't know how that could be a business record. Well, that's the business they're engaged in, I guess, is my point. I mean, they're engaged in the business of people meeting online and having discussions. You have to be a member to sign on there, to use their uh, website and, and go from there. So they keep track of that. When they were ordered to uh, get this information to the law enforcement, this is what they saved from her account. Every single account is what makes up their business. And so you, you would like to get in the actual contents of the conversation versus, for example, a business record of somebody's account number or the date that somebody signed up with that account? You want the actual conversation? Well, yes, because that's what, I mean, that's their business here. Okay, thank you. Ms. Candelius? Judge, I think the, the, the factor that um, the district attorney is not addressing is not, um, clear, that's not clear from his argument is that the records that we normally consider business records have they are accepted because there is an indicia of reliability they're using these records they're relying on them to um, for the function of their business here what we're talking about is a um, a conversation that there is no indicia of reliability there's no we have no idea even who these people are and they're certainly not relying on that to conduct their business I think that um, you know it's different. Certain information, they do, they are in the. Um, it is their business to keep certain records. I mean, I think that you know people set up accounts, but that but these conversations are not something they rely upon to conduct their own business, and so they just don't fall under the same exception. Thank you. The court has considered the arguments of counsel. Uh, I agree with the defense. Um, and I realize that times have changed with regard to the way businesses conduct. Um, 
that are operations with regard to these social networking operations, but it seems to me, uh, based on the language from the Court of Appeals, um, that the information that is being provided as part of a business relationship between Moco Space and an outsider is not being substantially relied upon when they are um, conducting their business or retaining their records for their business. I don't believe it's a hearsay exception to Rule 8036. Some things would be, for example, when this person opened up an account with them, their account number. Uh, but actual conversations between uh, the victim in this case and a third party is not a business record. I don't believe that the business substantially relies on those records to maintain their business records. So the court is going to sustain the defendant's objection. Are we ready to proceed? Let me just clarify one point, though, because the court, I believe, has the entirety of People's 97, I believe. I do, and it seems to me that it applies to uh, all of these third-party conversations. So I don't think the defense can get it in for the same reasons that they objected to it on any of these records. Thank you. Okay, let's bring the jury in. You're welcome to be seated. I apologize for the delay. We need to take care of some legal issues, so I apologize for the delay. Ms. Tyree, you're welcome to resume sitting down, and you're welcome to proceed, Mr. Miller. Sure. Here, I think we left off uh, when we were about to play People's Exhibit 60. Excuse me, People's Exhibit 70. So I'd ask that this be uh, played for the jury. It's just audio. I know the court has the audio control. Okay. Hello, this is a collect call from. No, no, no. An inmate at Weld County Jail. This call is subject to recording and monitoring. To accept charges, press 1. To refuse charges, press thank you for using Evercom. You may start the conversation now. Hello. Oh. <laughs> hello. Hello. So now that I'm talking to Aranda again, I'm going to see if she could take me to go and try to get my ID again. Oh, yeah? Yeah. You don't talk crap about me? No. About Jack Black? Well, at first, she freaking was, like, going all off and shit. I was like, what the fuck, man? I don't need to listen to this bullshit. Yeah. And I started going off on her and stuff, and then we didn't talk for like a month, a month and a half. Oh, yeah. Or no, no, not a month and a half, because you've only been in there for a month. Not even a month. Well, from the time that she found out, we haven't been talking, and then like just recently, we just started talking. Yeah. Because she realized that she was in the wrong. I was like, yeah. What'd she say? Nothing, really. She was just fucking just talking Ooh. shit. Saying if you're gonna talk to him and all that other bullshit, then I don't want nothing to do with you and blah blah blah. Oh, so I was like, well, fine then. If that's how you're gonna be. The more power to you. Yeah. Oh. She just got mad because I told her I don't want to talk to her no more. Yeah. Oh. Huh. Yeah, probably. Cause she didn't go over no more after that, huh? No. That was the last time she showed up. She used to go over all the time. Yeah, like every day, every other day. I didn't mean it, but she was being unra she was being unreasonable. Oh, I know. I thought it was kind of rude how she just got up and went over there and tried turning it down. I didn't think it was loud. I didn't think so either. A little portable thing don't have no speakers. But we're used to the loudness. Like even if there's like fucking people in the house or not. But I mean, she was still used like, to like, it. Protective of little Jack. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, we can't cuz She gets all mad, you know, like, I understand, but... 
exposure, you know what I mean? Yeah. Kids are going to go through it, you know? Exactly. We don't mean it. We're adults, you know what I mean? It's hard to check ourselves. Mm -hmm. We're adults, you know? We do adult things. We drink, we smoke, we cuss, we fight, we do adult shit, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's hard to check ourselves, you know? I, I, don't, I don't mean to, but it's not easy, you know? Oh, I know. Well, around my nephews, I check myself, though. Like, yeah. It's different when it's your, you know what I mean? Yeah. Your, when it's your family or when it's your, I guess it's different, but... Well, I hope you do get a chance to beat me down. Yeah, I will. I hope you get it. I hope so. That'd be a nice beat down. Uh, you will get a chance, and I will get a chance. And I'll get will. a chance to fill it, and I'll get a chance to do it. And you won't do it, though. Yeah, huh? Just give me a big, gigantic hug. Yeah, probably. <laughs> and then I'll hit you. <laughs> cigarette. Yeah, and then I'll hit you. And chubbies and a beer. And some sex. And, and some who? <laughs> yeah. What if, I'm, what if I'm too old by then? Oh yes, we'll get you some Viagra. Some Viag? Some Viva? <laughs> yeah. Viag? <laughs> yeah. Will you sing the song? Viva! Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> will. I gotta sing a you rock. You won't be old. Huh? You won't be old when you get out. I'm 31, I'm really getting gray hairs in my fucking goatee. <laughs> oh gray? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you have a lot on your books right, or, or on your plate right now. What's up? So you have a lot on your mind right now, so that's what it is. Not really, I don't. Old. Really, I don't. I try not to think about it, you know? But, no, that's good. You know, I try to just put it behind me and, in, 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 uh, not behind me, like, like, drown it out or hide from it, but just, there ain't nothing I can do about it, you know, and me thinking about it ain't doing me no good, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's just doing me bad and making me stressed and all that. It's not doing me no good. I just try to chill, you know, I try to be able to laugh and be able to... It's not easy, but... Oh, well, you're doing a pretty good job of it. Well, what can I do, you know what I mean? I can't cry yeah. out spill milk, you know, it's done, you know? Yeah. I would like to do a lot of things, you know, I would like to be out there and I would like to do a lot of things, but I can't, you know, I can't sit here and stress on it, you know what I mean? I know. Because it ain't going to make me get out, it's going to make my days all fucked up. Yeah. Uh, and then I'll be getting in fights all the time. Yeah, you don't need that. Well, I'll do it, but... <laughs> yeah, I know, but you don't need that. Oh, I know, I know. I've been close a couple times, been hitting the wall and shit. Getting yeah, you need to stop that, too. I'm done. <coughs> but they don't tell me that because it's quick. Yeah. They're scared of the fire extinguisher, extinguisher wielding. <laughs> You're retarded. <laughs> well, that's public knowledge anyway, so. Yeah. You know, it's fun to be proud of, but it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah, I don't start, yeah, I try not to think about it. Sometimes at night I do, you know, think about it. Well, it's hard not to. I try not to, but sometimes it's just there, you know? Yeah. I mean, it won't leave my brain. Well, that was a pretty, pretty hard moment, you know? Yeah. Pretty dark days. Should have just stayed home. You left. So you should have stayed. You left. You should have stayed. You left. You went to spend time with somebody. Carmen? Carmen Electra, yeah, yeah. I told you where I was going. Yeah, yeah I told you where I was going. <laughs> I know, but you should have stayed. I know, I should have. We should have done a lot of things different. I should have stayed. I should have done a lot of different, a lot of things different, you know? But should have, would have, could have, did, does, did, whatever. I know. Ain't no going back, no. I know. Okay. Hopefully, you know, I get some, hopefully I get some blood. I don't have to face forever, you know, but. You, you know, I, get, I might get some play, though, you know? Yeah. I'll deal with 10 years, I'll deal with 10. But even 15, I'll do that, you know, but. It's a long time, but anything more than that, hell no. I know. I'm 31, 15, 46, shit. Yeah. Tough, you know, but I'll still, you know, I'll still have, I'll have, still have some years out there, you know what I mean? Yeah. But all this fucking life shit and all this fucking 85 years, fuck all that. I don't think you will, with, especially with that person's lifestyle. Right, right. I mean, you know, I, mean, I, do, for get, real. I do, I do got some, some, some play there, you know what I mean? It's not like I just went up to a school teacher and shot her in the head, you know what I mean? 
Yeah. Went up to like a, you know, a law-abiding straight citizen that don't, you know what I mean? And just killed yeah. cold blood, cold blood, murder somebody, you know? Well, I think I, they're trying to get you with the, like the, um, um, the first degree because of that you were, um, that they were saying that you were sitting in there and you were like looking there or looking through the pictures and all that other crap. But still, but my, my lawyer said that that won't fly anyway. They're just trying to say that I premeditated it, that I sat there, thought about it, and then when the person came home, I acted through all my thoughts. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's not what happened. They're trying to say that's what happened, but yeah. that, that's not what happened at all, you know? Yeah. Um, so, you know, that ain't gonna fly with that. You know, all that hate crime shit and all that, that ain't gonna fly. But, you know, they're just, no. they're, they're just trying to put as much on me as they can, you know? Yeah. Because they know shit's gonna fall away. But when, you know, yeah. when they're like, okay, say, say you put 20 things on a person and 16 of those things fall away, you still got four things to work with. If you only put four yeah. things on a person, three of those things fall away, you only got one thing to work with. They don't want that, you know what I mean? They want to have some play. So they're trying to stack me up with as much crap as possible. So when yeah. they're falling away, they could still have a little bit of play, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That's what they want. You know, they want to hope, they, then they want to stack me up to look like this total straight up, this monster, you know, this person that don't care about human life. That's my name in true. Right, that's what I'm saying though. That's what, they, that's what they're trying to establish, you know what I mean? Yeah. In order for them to get the first degree, they got to establish that. They got to, they got to establish a plan that I plan to do this, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, that ain't gonna happen. Kind of get voluntary manslaughter or something. Yeah. Yep, yep. This lady killed her husband's mistress. Yeah. And I guess, fucking, like, she brought it down to, like, heat of the passion or some shit. So how much years did that person get? I don't know, for sure. That's what I want to find out. I'm here sitting on the couch with you. What movie was funny? That Step Brothers? Oh, yeah. Did you ever watch it? Have you watched it? No, I sure haven't, but I saw the previous. That's just funny. Is it? Yeah. When'd you see it? You know with who and when. Uh, it was funny anyway, though. I know, uh, I didn't mean to bring it up, but, you know, that's past, you know? I sure hope so. Well, even, mm-hmm. even if what you know, you know what I mean. Like, yeah. Something that happened is over. I got you know, it's looking forward now. You know what I mean. Yeah. You're the, you're the only person saw my family there for me, you know, and all of that. So. Well, I hope that freaking proves something to you. Well, I mean, you know, you know, I should have seen the light, you know, but I, I can understand, you know, where. Everybody's coming from. I can understand where you're coming from with staying with me, and then I can understand where you're, where she's coming from too, because everything I told her was straight bullshit. You know what I mean? You yeah. Know, and, and you know, I had her in the car, and I had you in there. You know, and I was lying to everybody. You know, and I can understand. You know what I mean? But you know, I'm glad that there's still somebody there that didn't take that to heart. You know, that still, you know, believe. Well, I took it to heart. Guarantee that. But you know what I mean? But in the end. But in the end, you didn't let that affect nothing, you know? No. You know, you're still you're still willing to stay around, you know, and some people ain't, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because, you know, and you can be realistic about it, you know, also. You know, this person, her, you know, she's like, well, he might not get out, you know what I mean? Yeah. And she, she wants to do her own thing, you know, she wants to have a life, and I can understand that. You know, I can't say that's nothing wrong with her, you know, with you. I want you to have a life, too, you know what I mean? I don't... But I'm glad that you're, you know, there. You have one minute left. Damn it. I glad you're being my friend and stuff. Yeah. Help me out and stuff, you know. But, all right, well, I'll go ahead and call you tomorrow. Like around 7, something like that, 8 o'clock. That's fine. I wasn't even right, well, talking to you, but. Huh? So I wasn't done talking to you, but all right. You want me to call you back? Yes. Hey. <laughs> What time is it? It's like 9.35. All right. Well, one more, because then I got to put in. Make them eat. All right. I'll call you right back. All right. Bye. Bye. The caller has hung up.
<clears throat> Ms. Tyree, was that a phone call between you and Mr. Andrade? Yes. And I just wanted to talk about a few things off of that um, because I'm not sure we were able to hear everything. Specifically, at one point in the conversation, are you discussing um, <clears throat> how he's doing in custody and how people are treating him? Your Honor, objection. This has already been admitted into evidence. <coughs> you don't need to go through it again. Given the clarity of the uh, recorded telephone call, it seems to me fair uh, to get into this a little bit more detail, and so the court's going to overrule the objection. Is that discussed on the phone call? Yes. And to that, is that when he responds that everyone's scared of the fire extinguisher wielder or something along those lines? I don't remember him talking about the. Does he say fire extinguisher in that phone call? I didn't hear anything in there. You also talk about um, you should have just stayed home telling on, uh, the defendant he should have just stayed home. Yes. And he told you that you left? Yes. Does that give you a better rec recollection of the time frame you remember him being gone? I believe you testified he, he was home on the 16th? Yes. Do you recall that he wasn't home on the 16th until really late that night, if yes. at all? So it was later that night. Okay. Do you remember what time? <clears throat> I believe it was 12 o'clock. So like midnight on the 16th? Yeah. Was he in the PT Cruiser that night, or do you remember? Yes, he was. And uh, a little bit more about the car. You, you told Detective Tharp you rode in the car a few yeah. times? Um, you also told him you were kind of suspicious about how he came into possession of the car? Kind of, yeah. And that's because he had no income? Mm-hmm. Yes. And on the call we just listened to, you kind of talked about the charges and what he was looking at, what he was facing. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yes. You, do you remember that discussion? Yes. And it sounded like he said, um, it's not like I went up to a school teacher and shot her in the head or killed a law-abiding straight citizen. Do you remember that part of the conversation? No. And that was just played for you when he said that? What was the question? It was just played over the speakers that he said that? I didn't hear that part in the, couldn't mm -hmm. hear it too clearly. <laughs> Were you listening while it was playing? Yes, I was. And you didn't hear him make that statement, nor a statement about wielding a fire extinguisher? No. And also at some, at some point, and you testified earlier, and I just want to get your um, exact answer on this. Um, you told Detective Tharp you weren't aware that the defendant was seeing anybody, <clears throat> but it sounds like you were aware he was seeing Felicia Mendoza? Towards the end, yeah. What do you mean by towards the end? Like, I would say maybe a month and a half after he was living with us. Okay, because it sounds like, like you got a little upset that he was seeing a movie with her? Mm -hmm. Yes. So you heard that part of the conversation? Yes. You um, also talked about the possibilities of what he was looking at as far as a sentence. Is that discussion you guys often had? No. If we could put up uh, People's Exhibit 29. 
Is that the car you, does that look like the car you'd seen him driving? Yes. Now, when you were testifying earlier, um, you mentioned that he was upset and he talked about killing himself at some point? Yes. Let me ask you this, in the jail, in the jail call we just listened to, he, tested, or he said something as far as hitting himself or something like that. What was he referring to? Objection, speculation, foundation. Do you know for a fact what he was referring to or would you be guessing or speculating? I don't know what he would be hitting. So I'm going to sustain the objection. Okay. Did he also talk about hitting the walls in the jail when he gets mad in that call? I don't remember. Okay. I have a hard hearing on my left ear, so I don't know. Um, so you, you don't know anything about the defendant hitting himself or anything like that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and you didn't hear that portion of the jail phone call when he said that? Asked an answer. Sustained. Nothing further. Thank you. Cross-examination. Ms. Tyree, when, on the night of July 30th, um, when the police first came to your door, do you remember what time that was? I believe it was 2 o'clock. No, it was 3. Are you talking about in the morning, a.m. or? A.m., yes. And so when they first knocked on the door, were you uh, asleep? Yes. Okay, did they wake you up? Yes. Okay. And once they woke you up, um, the Detective Tharp started talking to you and asking you questions, is that right? Yes. Okay. And was that just right after you had woken up? Mm hmm Okay. And then you actually left, um, you were told that you had to leave the apartment, is that right? Me and my sister and my niece and her boyfriend. Okay, so all of us had to. And so that was also still in that early morning hours. Yes, you had to leave the apartment. Yes. And then later you were um, interviewed again at the police station. Is that right? For about five minutes, yes. Okay, and that was later on the morning of July thirtieth. Yes. Okay. Um. So were you tired? Yes. Okay. Do you remember um, the phone conversation that we just listened to? Do you remember how long after Mr. Andrade had been arrested that you guys had that conversation? No. Okay. If I could have just a moment. Sure. asking you questions um, he asked you about a number of things that you said um, if you he asked you about a number of things whether you remembered saying them to detective Tharp do you remember that this morning yes okay and you testified that you didn't remember making certain statements yes okay have you um, did you is the do you know why you don't remember? Are they because these statements were made a long time ago? Or? Yeah, was, the statements were made a long time ago, and also it was early in the morning. There was a lot of people in and out of my house. Okay. And I had my one-year-old niece. Okay. 
you were taking care of your one-year-old niece? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I have nothing further. Anything else? No further questions, John. Thank you. You're welcome to step down. We appreciate your time. Feel free to adjust the microphone if you like. And once you're settled in, if you could, bless you, if you could introduce yourself to the jury by stating your name and spelling your last name. My name is Yvonne Woods, W-O-O-D-S. Thank you. You may examine. Thank you. Good afternoon, Agent Woods. Good afternoon. Can you tell the jury how you're currently employed? I'm employed as a laboratory agent with the Colorado Bureau of Investigation Crime Laboratory assigned to the Denver lab. And what are your duties um, as a lab agent? My duties are scientific in investigation in the fields of the biological sciences. And specifically, when you say biological sciences, what do you mean? That includes forensic serology, forensic DNA, and forensic hair and fiber examination and comparison. And do you have any other duties uh, uh, that go along with that as far as uh, reviewing cases and assigning cases as well? Well, all of the agents in my laboratory are assigned to review the work of other agents um, when necessary. But in addition to my scientific duties, uh, I do do technical reviews for other cases. And do you have any training or certifications or and certifications regarding hair and fiber analysis? I do have a large amount of training and a number of years of experience in the field of um, hair and fiber examinations. And currently, in my employment, I only do hair comparisons. I no longer do fiber comparisons. Have you been qualified as an expert? Well, let me ask you this. What is some of the training you've received for hair, hair analysis? I've attended the McCrone Institute of Microscopy School um, in um, Chicago, Illinois, which was a two-week school which focused specifically on the identification and characterization of hairs and um, hair comparisons. And is, do you undergo proficiency testing in your ability to, I guess, compare and analyze hair? Yes, I do. I'm required to successfully complete one proficiency test a year in the field of hair comparisons. And have you successfully completed those proficiency tests? Yes, I have. Have you been qualified as an expert before in hair and fiber analysis or comparison? Yes, I have. How many times? Approximately 75 times. Your Honor, at this time I move to admit Agent Woods um, as an expert in hair and fiber for this particular case, for hair and fiber analysis and comparison. No objection. And pursuant to Rule 702, the court is going to find that Agent Wood, based on her knowledge, skill, experience, and training, is an expert in the field of hair analysis and comparison. Are you requesting fiber as well, or just hair? Just hair at this point, Your Honor. And may offer an opinion with regard to that subject matter. Thank you. Can you describe to the jury what the process or procedure is for doing a comparison or analysis based on comparison of hairs? First of all, evidence is collected at a crime scene and it's submitted to the laboratory for evaluation and an, and an eventual analysis. That crime scene evidence is examined again for the presence of hairs and that's usually one of the tests we perform on evidence submitted because hair is transient, it'll fall off. It, um, so we collect it and preserve it for eventual analysis if necessary. And the reason we do hair examinations is to so, show that an association has taken place. So when hairs are collected and then forwarded for analysis, we uh, prepare the hairs and then um, take them on to either macroscopic or microscopic examinations. And what do you mean by macroscopic or microscopic examinations? A macroscopic examination is just a visual examination to see if the hairs look the same or they are different with just the use of the naked eye. A microscopic examination would involve the use of a microscope and thus the examination of microscopic characteristics to try to make an association or an exclusion between known hairs and question hairs.
Now, with respect to the case against Mr. Andrade, did you do a, a, a hair analysis in this case? Yes, I did. And you, can you tell the jury about that and what steps you took regarding that analysis? I received a number of items for hair evaluation and analysis. Some of these hairs were collected by another agent in my laboratory who did the serological examination. Her name is Agent Sarah Lewis. She collected some of these hairs and placed them into a hair and fiber packet, which was then forwarded to me for analysis. Um, a number of the other hairs that I examined were collected by the Greeley Police Department and submitted for analysis. And specifically, um, you said you received packets. Do you receive what's called standards or samples from a known person to compare to an unknown? Yes. And was that done in this case? Yes, it was. And can you tell the jury about uh, the comparisons you undertook in this case? Okay. A known hair sample would be pulled head hair or, or pulled hair from a known body source. The types of hair that we normally do microscopic and macroscopic examinations on are head hair and pubic hair because those types of hairs show differences from person to person. So consequently, when we receive questioned hairs from a crime scene, we request that known hairs or pulled hairs from individuals thought to be involved are also submitted for examination. So the questioned hairs collected from the crime scene are evaluated, first of all, macroscopically and then microscopically, if necessary, um, to see if the questioned hairs from the crime scene could have originated from one of the known samples that were submitted for comparisons. When a hair examination is performed, there are three different results that could be obtained. One of those is that the hairs are not consistent and could not have come from the, a common source. Another conclusion could be that the hairs are consistent and could have come from a common source, or the hairs could be inconclusive to where there's not enough characteristics present in order to make a conclusion um, as to the origin of those hairs. Now, when you receive a case, um, or when you receive hair uh, or DNA, if you're doing that sort of analysis, do you receive information uh, about where these items are, came from and, and about the case itself? Yes, we do. Okay. And in this case, did you receive uh, information from the Greeley Police Department as it relates to fibers from scalp that you analyzed or looked at? Yes. And can you tell the jury about that? Yes, um, there was an item collected from Angie Zapata that was listed as being fibers from the scalp area. These hairs were examined macroscopically and they were determined to possibly have originated from her. They were consistent in macroscopic characteristics and could have come from a common source. So these, these fibers you're talking about were from Angie Zapata, based on your opinion? Yes, and when counsel says fibers, these were actually hair, um, hairs that were collected, and they were macroscopically consistent with the known that was su supplied to me from Angie Zapata. Were you also provided an item labeled hair from victim's mouth? Yes. And can you tell the jury about your comparison there? That hair was examined microscopically, and that hair was determined to be a Caucasian head hair which was microscopically consistent with the head hair control from Angie Zapata and could have originated from her. Okay. And uh, did you receive also uh, from the Greeley Police Department an item labeled fibers from buttocks? Yes, I and, did. And did you do a comparison with that? Yes, that sample was determined um, to not contain hair at all. So there was no hair in that sample. And in this case, you received a standard uh, to compare from both the defendant and the victim in the case? I did not receive a head hair standard from Mr. Andrade. I received a pubic hair standard from him. Okay. And I believe you said earlier the purpose um, 
and I, tell me if I'm stating this wrong, the purpose of uh, doing hair, is it a comparison or analysis, is to um, determine a relationship. Is that it? Yes, we tend to call it an association. Um, hair is an associative type of evidence. Um, the presence of hairs shows that there may have been an association between individuals. Okay. And from the hairs or fibers that were provided from the victim's body, was there an apparent association to the defendant based on what you reviewed? No. Were you given an explanation, or do you know why head hair samples weren't provided of, of the defendant? I think um, the, if I remember correctly, the hairs from that individual were too short to be collected. Your Honor, I would object. Uh, this question calls for hearsay. Mr. Miller? It's what she's basing her opinion on. I think it's admissible under these circumstances. Why? She didn't receive a head. Mr. Buck, or Detective Buckingham testified to this. I'm going to sustain the objection. It doesn't go towards her opinion. It, it goes as to what evidence she had to make an opinion. And so the court's going to sustain the objection. Are oftentimes, is oftentimes head hair too short to get samples for, for you to compare? Yes. Nothing. Cross examination. Your Honor, if I could have one moment. Sure. I just have one question for you. Um, you stated a moment ago, you testified a moment ago that uh, you did an examination on hairs retrieved from Angie Zapata, is that right? That's correct. But you actually wrote on your examination report that the person's hairs was actually Justin Zapata, is that true? My report actually refers to only Zapata. So you're saying that you didn't write a report that said that the victim in this case was Justin Zapata? My report makes reference to an individual by the name of Zapata. If I could have a moment, Your Honor. <coughs> Um, on your report, you list involved suspects as the suspect being Alan Ray Andrade and the victim being Justin Zapata. Is that true? That's correct. Okay, thank you. I don't have any further questions. Any redirect? Not based on that, Your Honor. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Sarah Lewis, L E W I S. Thank you. May I examine? May I approach first, Your Honor? I have some of the examples. Tell us where you work, Agent Lewis. Yes, I'm a laboratory agent for the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, otherwise known as CBI, in the Denver Laboratory in the Biological Sciences section. And how long have you been there? I've been there for a little over two years. I started training there in March of 2007 and have been doing independent casework since February of 2008. And what is your job title? My job title is laboratory agent, DNA analyst, and serological analyst. Can you describe for the jury a little bit about what your duties entail there? My main duties entail me examining items of evidence for the presence of biological material with the ultimate goal of obtaining a DNA profile from that biological material. Let's talk a little bit about your education and work experience. Can you tell the jury about your prior work experience? Yes, prior to working for the CBI, I was a DNA analyst for the Armed Forces DNA Identification Lab out in Rockville, Maryland. There, my main duties were to use DNA identification to help identify missing service members from past war conflicts, such as World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. Anything else? 
prior to going there, I was a laboratory technician for the uh, Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, where I did basic molecular research. And let's talk a little bit about your education. Do you want to tell the jury about that? Yes, I have a Bachelor of Science degree in biochemistry from the University of Missouri, and I'm also currently enrolled as a graduate student at the University of Denver, where I am working towards a Master of Science degree in biological sciences with an emphasis in forensic genetics. How many serology examinations have you done? Throughout my training and my casework, I've done hundreds to thousands. And are you a member of any professional organizations? Yes, I am an associate member of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. I'm also a member of the Rocky Mountain Division of the International Association of Identification and a member of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And have you testified before as an expert witness in your career? Yes, I have. And how many times have you testified as an expert witness? Four times. And was that for serology? Yes, it was. Okay. How many times here in Weld County? Once. Is the laboratory that you work at, the Colorado Bureau of Investigation Lab, is that accredited? Yes, it is. What does that mean? A accreditation is a voluntary program in which any crime lab can participate. So in order to become accredited, we just have to show an auditing, an outside auditing agency that we follow specific protocols and have the proper security and facilities to properly analyze evidence. Your Honor, at this time I'd move to have, um, sorry, Ms. Lewis qualified as an expert in biological sciences. Your Honor, if I could ask a few questions. Sure. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So, correct me if I'm wrong, are you currently sort of in training and in the master's program at, at University of Denver? I, I'm currently in, in the master's program at the University of Denver, yes. Okay, so as of right now, the you have a bachelor's degree. Correct. And you're working on completing your master's degree. Correct. My okay. coursework is completed. I just have to complete my thesis. Okay. Is your work at CBI part of your degree or is that a or is that just a separate thing? Separate. Okay. So in working at CBI, you've done analyzations of, of DNA non-related to your coursework for your master's degree. Correct. I don't have any other questions. Thank you. We have Thank no you. objection. And so the court is going to find based on Agent Lewis's knowledge, skill, experience, training, and education pursuant to Rule 702 of the Rules of Evidence that she is an expert in the field of biological sciences. And are you asking for serology? Yes and that she may testify and offer an opinion thereof. Thank you. Agent Lewis, can you please tell the jury what forensic science is? Forensic science is using science and applying that to matters of law. And what about forensic serology? Forensic serology means um, it's the study of biological fluids, such as blood, semen, saliva, things like that. Can you tell everyone what DNA is? DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. It's often referred to as your genetic blueprint because it's the molecule within your cells, within your body, that tell your cells what to do, how to function, how to make you, you. And um, where is DNA found in the human body? I think you just said in the cells, in every cell? DNA is found in almost all cells within your body, so you can find it in your blood, semen, saliva, your hair, your skin, your bones, pretty much everywhere in your body. And is your DNA the same in every cell? Yes, it is. Okay. And do any two people have the same DNA? No, except for identical twins. The reason for that being they're com they are split from the same fertilized egg, so you have the same DNA to start with, and then the egg will split. Therefore, they will have the same DNA, identical twins. And how is it useful for forensic purposes, DNA? DNA is useful for forensic purposes because we look at specific regions that are known to differ among people. So if you think of your DNA, more than 
is exactly the same for every human being. It's what makes you human. It gives you two legs or two eyes, that sort of thing. However, there's less than 1% that varies among individuals. And that's what we look at in our forensic testing in order to identify specific individuals. And can you explain to the jury the process of DNA analysis, starting with when you do a stain um, all the way until you get a DNA profile? Yes, when we examine evidence and we determine that there is a stain of biological evidence or where we think that there might be biological evidence, then we take either a swab or a cutting of that stain. A swab just being a, a Q-tip that you use to actually swab the item. Then we then take either the Q-tip or the material that the DNA may be on and place it into a small tube. To that tube and to the swab or the item of evidence, we add certain chemicals. These chemicals release the cells from that item and break them open so the DNA can get out of the cells. We then go through another process where we purify that DNA, so where we're left with just a simple um, extract, is what we call it, of DNA. Then we go through a step known as DNA quantitation. This allows us to determine how much human DNA we actually have in that sample. Once we figure out that we do have human DNA in that sample, then we go through a process, a technique known as PCR. This stands for polymerase chain reaction. This is just a technique that biologists use in order to copy, make billions of copies of specific regions of that DNA that we're looking for. So if you remember I said that we're looking at that less than 1% part of your DNA, well this technique allows us to look at the specific regions that we're interested in in our forensic testing. For us, we look at 13 specific regions. This is because the FBI has determined that all crime labs need to look at the same 13 regions, so they're, therefore they can compare among states or, or different labs and, and upload them to the National DNA Database. So we look at these 13 particular regions. So this PCR test allows us to see those regions. Then once we obtain that DNA profile, we compare the unknown samples, the crime scene samples for example, to a known sample from an individual to see if there is a match. These known samples usually come in the form of what's known as a buckle swab. A buckle swab is just the swabbing from the inside of your cheek to collect the cells that are inside your cheek and then we call that a known sample because we physically saw the swab go on your cheek and then that DNA is coming from you. So we call that the known sample. So in order for us to determine who the source of a DNA sample is, we have to have the knowns to compare them to. So that's what we do as a DNA analyst. Thank you. And are the technologies that are used by you at CBI, are those done only by CBI or other labs do this the same way? No, um, virtually all crime labs. I object speculation. Are you speculating or do you know for a fact that, that what you're about to say is true? I do know for a fact that's... I'll overrule the objection. Well, why don't you ask the question again? Sure. Are these technologies done solely by the CBI laboratory? No, these techniques have, have been around for a while and, it, and have, are used by the majority of, of crime labs. And how do you know that you're getting correct results when you're doing this kind of testing? We know we're getting correct results because I always used controls in my case. So, for example, what we call a positive control is when we take a, a sample that we have where we know the answer, we know what that DNA profile is, and we process it along with all of our unknown samples. And then in the end, if we get the expected result from that positive control, then we can assume that, the, in fact, the, the process worked correctly. Agent Lewis, is it possible to have more than one source of DNA developed from a single swab or a cutting or a piece of evidence that you have? Yes. What is that called? It's called a mixture. We, it's a very simple process. Um, when you have more than one person's DNA on an item, then we say it is a mixture of DNA. Okay. Um, a couple more questions about the lab and you in general. Does the CBI lab have a regular system of proficiency testing that you're aware of? Yes, as, as part of our accreditation, which I spoke of earlier, we as DNA analysts have to undergo proficiency testing every six months. So twice a year we all have to undergo this proficiency test. That basically means that an outside agency sends us a few samples where they know the correct DNA profile and what it should be. We go ahead and process it using our 
equipment and our chemicals and everything that we would normally do in a case and process it the same way and then turn in those results, the answers, to that outside agency and they make sure that we are in fact correct and get the correct results. And have you personally ever made an error in a proficiency test? No, I have not. Okay. Does the Carter Bureau of Investigation have a quality assurance or quality control program that meets generally accepted standards for forensic labs conducting DNA testing? Yes, we do. And you stated earlier that you've performed anywhere from hundreds to thousands of DNA or serology analysis. Um, have you actually performed DNA typing on a piece of evidence from a crime scene before? Yes, I have. And you did have an occasion to examine um, evidence in this case, correct? That's correct. You were sent numerous items, I believe. Um, some of those were tested and some of those were not. Do you know why that is? We, we don't always um, test every piece of evidence that we may receive. This is just based on the fact that as analysts, we're allowed that discretion to decide what we what pieces of evidence might answer the questions that we might be looking for. Your Honor, may I approach the witness? Yes. I'm handing you what's been marked as People's Exhibit 79. Um, do you know what that is? Yes, I see that it is CBI number three. On all of our pieces of evidence, when I received them into my custody, I wrote down the specific case number, the specific item number for that actual item, and then my initials. And then at the CBI lab, we also have this bright blue tape that we use to seal once we're finished with our analyses. And again, I sign the, the tape on that as well. So I see that it is CBI number three. And what is CBI number three? May I refer to my reports? Do you have those with you? Yes. Your Honor. Step five. CBI item number three is a cigarette butt from marker number 40. And when and how was this received, do you know, at your lab? I received this on July 24th of 2008. And where do items like this get stored in your lab? We have a, an evidence section that <coughs> receives the evidence and then properly stores the items of evidence until we are ready to work on them. And then once we are ready to do our analyses, then we go to the evidence and get the custody of those items. And were there tests performed on this item? Um, yes. Okay. Um, what tests were those? I just collected uh, the um, cigarette for DNA, so I took a cutting from the filter end of the cigarette butt for my DNA testing. And were, what were the results of your examination? The results of this examination was that I found a mixture of DNA. Again, this means that more than one person's DNA was found on the cigarette butt. And who was it a mixture of? Let me find that exact report. The DNA profile that I developed from the cigarette butt, item three, revealed the presence of a mixture to which both Zapata and Andrade could not be excluded as being contributors. So what does that mean, they cannot be excluded? It means that both of their DNA is present on that item. And do you assign a numerical significance when you find DNA on an item like that? Yes, when we, when we do DNA we, and we find that there is a match or that somebody cannot be excluded, then we have to determine the significance of the match, sort of the weight of that match. So by doing that, we do statistics on that item. And in this case, I did statistics from, um, to determine how, how many people that you would expect, probability-wise, chosen randomly from the population, how many people would, would be excluded from this profile, meaning they could not possibly contribute to that profile. And I found that 99.99997% of the population could be excluded from that profile. And when you say the population, do you mean the population of Greeley, Colorado, the United States? What is your population? The United States. The United States. Thank you. Um, Your 
Your Honor, may I approach? I grab the wrong person. May I approach the witness? I'm standing in what has been marked and admitted as People's Exhibit 82. Do you know what that is? Yes. Again, I see my case number, my item number, and my initials, and that bright blue tape with my initials on it as well. Okay. Other than being repackaged, does it appear to be in the same condition as the last time that you saw it? Yes, it does. Okay. And how was that item received? Was it received the same way as the cigarette butt was? Yes, it was received into my custody the same way. Okay. And what test did you perform on this item? On this item, if I may... I swabbed with, again, like a Q-tip and moistened water. I swabbed the zipper area and the handle of the purse to see who may have held that purse. Why did you swab those areas? Because that is the typically the area where you would perhaps leave DNA behind if you're holding the purse a lot. People shed skin cells, thousands of them per day. So you can leave behind your skin cells on that item. And, and the same as the zipper too. If you're pulling on the zipper, you might leave some of your DNA behind. So those were the areas I chose to test. And did you find DNA? Yes, I did. And what were the results of your DNA analysis? This is item four. I also received, I developed a mixture profile from this item. Again, that means more than one person's DNA I found on, on the zipper and on the handle of this item, to which Zapata, Andrade, Alejandro, and Ram are excluded as potential contributors, which means I did not find their DNA on those areas that I swapped. If I could have just a moment. I did show you the wrong purse. All right. If I can get that one back. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show you what's been marked as people's exhibit 83. Do you know what that is? Yes. Again, I see my case number, my item number, my initials, my bright blue tape with my initials on it, as CBI number 55. And that item as well, you received it in the same way as the other items? That's correct. And it was also stored in your lab? Correct. And what test did you perform on that? The, the same test that I spoke of before, where I would take a swabbing of the handle area and the zipper areas. And did you find DNA? Yes, I did. What did you find with respect to People's Exhibit 83? On this purse, I also found a mixture, this time of more than two people. So I can tell by my analyses that more than two people have touched this item, to which both Zapata and Andrade could not be excluded as potential contributors to that mixture. This time, the percent of the population that I would expect to be excluded from this, based on population statistics, would be 99.98% of people would be excluded from this person. Thank you. May I approach again? Sure. I'm bringing you what's marked People's Exhibit 78. Do you know what that is? Yes, I do. And was it also received in the same way that the other items were and stored in your lab? Yes, it was. And was there testing done on this item as well? Yes, there was. With respect to People's Exhibit 78, um, what were the results of your serological exam? The serological exam on this item, I swabbed, I took a swabbing of the exterior of this item and then did a presumptive test for semen. That test was negative for semen. And did you find any DNA? I did. What were the results of your DNA examination? The DNA profile that I developed from 
Item number 20, CBI item number 26, the vibrator match the DNA profile developed from Andrade. And you gave percentages in the other, uh, or on the other items. What is your opinion with regard to this item? On this one, I... Your Honor, just regarding this piece of evidence, we just renew our earlier objection. Your objection earlier is noted. Welcome to continue. I'm sorry, what is your opinion with regard to this item? That the, to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty, that Andrade is the source of the DNA profile that I developed from this item. And can you explain to the jury what that means, um, a reasonable degree of scientific certainty? Yes, that is what we say as a DNA analyst when the probability of it being a random person chosen from the population is less than one in a thousand times the U.S. population. So currently the U.S. population is about 300 million. So what I'm saying here is that the chance of it being somebody else's DNA is less than one in 300 billion people. And with regard to this item, um, did you find a small or a vast quantity of DNA? I found a, a large amount of DNA. Okay. Um, let's talk about that for a minute. Where on somebody's body would you find a DNA-rich source? DNA-rich sources are usually what we consider blood, semen, saliva, the, uh, vaginal secretions, and such. Have you had lots of experience with touch DNA? Yes, I do. Okay, can you explain to the jury a little bit about what touch DNA is? Touch DNA is, is exactly how it sounds. It's what you may leave behind by touching an <coughs> object. Like I mentioned before, humans shed many cells a day. And so whenever you touch something, you have the opportunity to leave those cells behind. Touch DNA is what we can obtain by swabbing an area where we think that somebody may have touched. And in your opinion, based on your training and experience with um, DNA and touch DNA specifically, do you believe that the DNA sample found on People 78, this pink vibrator, do you think that it was left there from simple touch DNA? Based on the quantity of DNA that I obtained from this item, it is, it is my opinion that it is not from touch DNA, that it came from a DNA-rich source. So just to be clear on this item, um, Agent Lewis, there was no mixture. There was just one DNA um, sample that you came from, or I'm sorry, that you discovered. That's correct. I found one individual's DNA on this item. Thank you. If I could approach the witness. True. I want to talk to you a little bit about some other items that were submitted to your lab for analysis. Um, did you receive an oral swab that came from the victim in this case? I believe you have it listed as, I think it's item 18A. 18A? Yes. Okay. And what did you find with regard to that swabbing? I'm sorry, what, what item are we just talking about? This is on her report, item 18A. It is an oral swab taken from the victim. Thank you. From the oral swab, I did a presumptive test for semen on that swab, which I found negative. Okay. I did not do any further testing on that item. What about the anal swab taken from the victim? That is listed in your report as item 18C. 18C was the same. I found, I tested it for um, semen and it was also negative. What about the underwear of the victim, which I believe you packaged into DNA packet number two, item 19. On item 19, I also looked for the presence of semen and I found presumptively that semen was present on item 19. So I forwarded on for DNA analysis and there I developed a profile which matched Zapata. 
And with regard to the fingernail um, clippings that you received in this case, did you do any analysis on those? Yes, I did. And what were your findings? And these were the fingernail clippings from the victim. I think you have them labeled as item 18E, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. On the fingernail clippings, I looked for the presence of blood, which was positive. They were positive for the, president, the presence of, of blood. And then I forwarded them on for DNA testing. And I also developed the profile which matched that at, of Zapata. So again, the victim's DNA? Correct. Okay. After you completed all the testing in this case, Agent Lewis, what did you do with the evidence that um, needed to be returned? Once I'm finished with, with my testing, then I seal up everything and return it to our evidence technicians, the same people who received the evidence when it was brought in, and then it was then sent back to the Greeley de Police Department. And did you at some point receive a fire extinguisher with regard to this case? Yes, I did. And what were your results um, regarding the fire extinguisher? I examined the fire extinguisher for the presence of blood, and I did not find blood on the fire extinguisher. Um, let me ask you, in your training and experience, if a, an item of that sort had been subjected to the elements for almost two months, would you expect to find anything on it? Judge, I'm going to object to the foundation. She's an expert, Your Honor, and I think she's allowed to render an opinion with regard to this. I'm going to roll the objection. Uh, based on uh, where it was found, the DNA, even though it's very hardy per se, it does degrade very easily. And if it's in certain elements, such as heat, things like that, then it can degrade. About rain? Yes. And I think that Agent Woods already testified to this, but um, just to make sure, there were also hair and fiber samples that were collected in this case? That's correct. And those were given to her? Yes. Okay. If I could have just one moment. Sure. Further questions? Thank you. Cross examination. Um, Agent Lewis, I want to I want to start by talking about uh, the pink vibrator. This is. Uh, People's evidence number 78, okay? Um, I think under the CBI, the number was 26. Yes. You testified a moment ago about this, this notion of touch DNA and that in your opinion, the DNA um, that came from this item was not due to just touching, right? Correct. And I think you stated that um, there's sort of a number of, and then I think you, you stated that this was due to the fact that there was so much DNA on it, is that right? That's correct. And I think you listed a whole number of, of different things that would generally leave a larger amount of DNA on an object. I think you said blood and semen and saliva and those type of things, correct? Correct. Would sweat be one of those things? No, we don't usually typically think of sweat as DNA rich. Yes, it, it does have DNA in it because you, contains your cells in your sweat when you sweat. So let's say that someone had sweaty hands, very sweaty hands, when they touched an item, could that possibly leave more DNA? It is possible, but I would say, based on my experience, not probable. Okay, but it is possible. Correct. So would it be true for me to say that in this case, you can't say with 100% certainty that the DNA that you found on this item was not left by touch DNA? I cannot say with 100% certainty. Okay. And 
other than DNA, you didn't find any other substances of interest on it. Is that true? That's correct. I want to talk about uh, the cigarette butts that you tested in this case. I believe one of them was marker number 40, it's item 3, and the other one was marker 17, and that's item 2. Okay. Do you know that I'm, what I'm referring to here? Yes. Okay. Let's start with, with uh, marker number 40, which is item number 3 in the CBI report. Um, this is the one where you noticed that there was a mixture of DNA, correct? Correct. And that your belief was that mixture was between uh, Justin Zapata and Alan Andrade, is that correct? Correct. Okay. And based on that mixture, it means that, I guess in, in your expert opinion, it means that both of these people handled this item at some point. Both of these people had contact with this item, correct? Correct, they cannot be excluded from that profile. Okay. And I think you, you testified that the way the, the piece of that that you used to test was, uh, was that you, you cut off a piece of the end, is that right? The filter end that would typically come in contact with the mouth. Okay, so it was the end towards the mouth end versus the end towards the tobacco end. Correct. Okay. And then now I want to refer to item, um, this is item two in the CBI report, marker number 17. This is the other cigarette butt that was, that was tested. Um, and in this cigarette butt, there was the profile that was developed matched the DNA profile of Justin Zapata, correct? That's correct. Only Justin Zapata, and there was no mix, mixture on this one? That's correct. Okay. I'd like to now turn your attention to the fire extinguisher, which I believe is item number 35. Okay. And again, you testified a moment ago that there was no blood that was found on this item, correct? That's correct. And am I correct in saying that a DNA test was not performed on this item? No, it was not. And just so I'm clear, I don't mean to continually sort of summing up what you testified a moment ago, I just want to make sure that I'm clear on it. Mm -hmm. The item number 54, which was the uh, tan purse, you found a mixture of DNA on that. However, both Justin Zapata and Alan Andrade are actually excluded as potential contributors to, the, to that DNA profile. That's correct. So it wasn't them who was this DNA profile, basically. Correct, the DNA profile that I obtained, they were excluded from. <laughs> Now you also tested some mattresses, is that correct? That's correct. You test the blue mattress and a white mattress. Yes. Um, and on the white mattress you tested for semen and there was none found, is that right? On the white mattress item, not correct. And then on the blue mattress, you found you tested again for semen and you found the presence of what's called acid phosphatase. Is that, is that how you pronounce it? That's correct, acid okay. phosphatase. Okay. And this is an enzyme um, that's that's prevalent or found in high concentrations of semen, correct? Correct. Now does that indicate to you that there was semen present on this mattress? It's what we call a presumptive test. We, we presume that that is in fact semen, so we go ahead and test it further with DNA. Okay. <coughs> and then you did a DNA profile and it, and it didn't match either Justin Zapata or Alan Andrade. That's correct. Thank you, I have nothing further. <coughs> you read right? Yes, ma'am. Agent Lewis, you were just talking about um, the amount of DNA that was found on 
the vibrator, which is People's Exhibit 78, your item 26. Um, can you tell the jury, you did DNA analysis on the purse as well. Let's take the purse for comparison. Compare the purse and the vibrator, and can you explain to the jury, contrast the different amount of DNA that was found on one versus the other? Okay. During all that DNA quantitation process, which I spoke of, where we determine how much human DNA is present in our sample, I determined that there were 19.62 nanograms per microliter of DNA from the vibrator, and the purse that I obtained, the mixture from 55, item 55. How much, I'm sorry? 0.36 nanograms per microliter of DNA in that sample. So 19.62 on the vibrator and only 0.36 on the purse? Correct. Okay. And what about the cigarette butt? The cigarette butt. Three point six one nanograms per microliter, and that was as you told Mr. Martin from the filter end that would be in somebody's mouth. Correct. So again, that would be from a DNA source from some place that is DNA rich, saliva Correct. in the mouth. Yes. And that was only three point six one, but the sample that you found on the vibrator was significantly more than that. Nineteen point six two. Nineteen point six two. Correct. You were asked by Mr. Martin why you, whether or not you performed any DNA analysis on the fire extinguisher, and you said no. Um, can I assume that's because there was no blood? That's correct. So, um, when explaining to the jury the difference between saying that there's a percentage that someone could be excluded versus um, you knowing with a reasonable degree of scientific certainty, what's the difference? Can you explain that a little bit? Well, when we say it's a reasonable degree of scientific certainty, <coughs> that's usually when we have a single source profile. So one individual on an item in evidence and we get that DNA profile. We say that the chance of it being somebody other than this individual is less than one in 300 billion. When I say cannot be excluded, that's usually what we use when there's a mixture. So we have multiple DNA that we're looking at and we say that they cannot be excluded from that item of evidence. So the only difference really is if you're talking about a single sample versus a mixture. Right, and the, and the statistics that we use. Okay, if I could have one moment. Just one last issue, um, Agent Lewis. When you were talking about the amount of DNA found on this vibrator, you said that it likely came from a DNA-rich source. Can you go over those one more time for the jury? What were those again? Judge, this has been asked to answer. Well, Judge, I don't know if she fully explained. What she said was blood, semen, vaginal secretions, and the like. And so, without her repeating herself, if she wants to supplement that answer, she's certainly welcome to. Do you have anything to add? Anything that come it, that is an um, an intimate part of your body. It's a really hard question to ask, I guess, and a hard question for you to answer. But could inside someone's anus or rectum would that be an area where you could find a DNA rich source? Yes. Thank you. And finally, um, you were asked about whether or not sweaty palms could have um, caused the amount of DNA that was found on this vibrator. And I think you said it's possible but not probable. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Nothing further. Any recross? Briefly. 
You testified a moment ago that the reason that you didn't perform a DNA test on the fire extinguisher is because there was no blood found on it, correct? Correct. There wasn't any blood found on the two purses, was there? That's correct. But you did perform a DNA test on those? Yes, I did. Thank you. I have nothing further. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome to step down. We appreciate your time. Any objection? No. Thank you. Your subpoena is excused. Feel free to adjust that microphone if you want to. And once you're settled in, sir, if you can introduce yourself to the jury by stating your name and uh, spelling your last name. Okay. My name is Christian Rubio, R-U-B-I-O. Thank you. You may examine. Thank you. What is your occupation, Mr. Rubio? I'm the Director of Community Management at MocoSpace.com. And how long have you been in that occupation? I've been in that occupation since May of 2007. And what are your duties? My duties are to oversee enforcement of terms of service ensuring safety of the community and also to do some basic uh, content optimization to keep the site interesting for newer users. What does that mean, content optimization? That just means, you know, feature some really cool users or, you know, some interesting content that users will add for the community. And can you tell the jury what MOCO space stands for? Sure, MOCO space, um, the MOCO stands for mobile communities and uh, space is because it's an online space so it's like other social networks on the internet except uh, the reason uh, we call it mobile communities is because the site is built for full interactivity through the mobile phone. And can you tell the jury a little bit about I guess in more detail what you can do on MoCo Space? Sure, you, uh, you can fill out a profile and start to make friends by meeting other people with common interests, add photos, add videos, uh, blog, <coughs> You can also chat, you can also engage in discussion forums, and many of the common things that people do on different social networks. And when somebody signs up for a MoCo Space account, um, are there options where they can choose what gender they are? Yes. And what are the possible available options on MoCo Space for gender? They are female and male. There's no transgender? There's not. What about sexual orientation? There is uh, straight, gay, lesbian, bisexual. Were you at some point asked to take any action with regard to Angie Zapata's MoCo Space account in this case? Uh, yes, under, under subpoena, I was asked to uh, secure the account and turn over all available records. Okay. And were you asked to do the same with regard to an account belonging to Alan Andrade? Uh, yes. And with regard to Angie Zapata's account, were you able to freeze that account? Yes. What about with regard to Alan Andrade's? Uh, when, I, when I went to perform the search for it in the database, there was no user found. <laughs> Let's talk for a minute about how someone would go about canceling their MoCo Space account if they chose to do so. Mm -hmm. um, how would, would someone have to take an affirmative action in order to close their account? Yes, you have to go through what we call a cancellation flow. And can you explain to the jury what the cancellation flow is? Sure, it's basically uh, you go into your existing account, into your account settings, and you select the option to cancel an account. Um, at which point you are put through a flow of questions, basically, uh, a couple of brief questions to ask if you're sure you want to do it, and if you're leaving, could you tell us why? That's optional. So when it asks if you're sure that this is something you want to do, you have to a second time yes. take an affirmative step to? you have to confirm. Okay. And what happens once somebody says yes, they would like to deactivate their account? The account goes inactive, but is not necessarily completely erased from the database uh, for about a 24-hour cycle, uh, overnight basically. So you know, if they do it at midnight, it may only be a few hours. If they do it early in the morning, it may be all the way through the night that it's still, uh, it's still in the databases, but not accessible and it's not going to be found by other users when they go to interact with it. So. Okay, so um, is there a certain time that MoCo Space does that where they... Overnight. Overnight? Yeah. Okay. So let's say, for example, that I have a MoCo Space account and I choose to cancel it right now. Mm -hmm. When would my information be gone from the site entirely? By tomorrow, tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning? Yeah. Um, if... 
Um, I deactivated my account, but I had posted comments on other people's pictures or profiles. Would those disappear as well? Those will come down, yeah. <laughs> So once this information is basically deleted from public view and nobody's able to access it anymore, how long is this information re retained by MoCo Space? Uh, we don't retain it past the time that the servers update, mainly for the security of our, our users uh, to protect our privacy. And again, that would be overnight? Yeah. Okay. So when you were asked to look up Alan Andrade's profile, when were you asked to do that? Um, I don't have the dates in front of me, so I don't quite recall at this time. Do you remember if it was last year? Yes. Okay. Do you remember if it was in July? Yeah. Uh, yes. It was pretty much around the same time as, as being asked to retain Angie's. Okay. So if we go to the very latest date in July, for example, um, based on the time frame that you described, it could have been deleted as early as the night before the last day of July, is that correct? Yeah. And it also could have been deleted before that? Yes. Okay. If I could have just a moment. I just have a couple quick questions. Um, if somebody had a MoCo Space site and erased it, um, you said that it would be completely erased after a, within a 24-hour period. Is the account would be, uh, yeah, it would be gone. So, but there would be a time. I just want to make sure I'm clear. There would be a time period after somebody deleted their account that it would still be on the database, just not accessible. Right. And so, if someone deletes an account, they um, it's on the database still. It's not accessible, and then it goes completely away at some time in the next 24 hours, depending on when your computers yep. do that. Okay. And then after that, it's not accessible in any way. Right. Okay. Um, as a, you talked about some of what your duties were as the director of the, I'm sorry, community management? Yes. Okay. As, um, are you aware of how people sign up for a MoCo Space account? Yes. Okay. And so when somebody is signed, decides to sign up and create a MoCo Space account, um, is there any kind of check on as to what kind of information they put on there to determine if it's true or false? Uh, no, that's up to the users. It's in the terms of service that uh, if they, you know, basically if they mislead, you know, or you know, basically any information that they enter is up to them, is on their, is on them. So for example, um, if somebody wanted, if a 19 year old wanted to put up a MoCo space site that said that she was 30, they could do that and you wouldn't have any way of knowing whether right. that person was telling the truth right. or not. And the same thing would go with um, gender, is that right? True. Okay. Age. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. And if I could have just a moment. Sure. Thank you. I have nothing further. Any redirect? Can MoCo Space be accessed through either a phone or a computer? Yes. So cancellation can be done either one of those two ways as well? Either way. Thank you. Any recross on that limited issue? No, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Is this witness excused from his subpoena? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Next witness, please. 
And once you're settled in, if you can please introduce yourself to the jury by stating your name and spelling your last name. Okay. My name is Felicia Mendoza, M-E-N-D-O-Z-A. Thank you. You may examine. Thank you. Ms. Mendoza, without giving us your address, can you just tell the jury where you live generally? South Denver. Thank you. And do you know Alan Ray Andrade? I do. How do you know him? He's my ex-boyfriend. Do you see him here in the courtroom today? I do. Can you please point him out and describe something that he's wearing? A gray long sleeve shirt. Okay. And is he seated here? Yes. Your Honor, would you let the record reflect that this witness has identified the defendant? Very well. Um, you said that he was your ex-boyfriend. Um, when did the two of you date? Mm -hmm. Last summer and the year before that. How did you meet him? Through an internet, internet dating site, the C Lounge. Z Lounge? C Lounge. C? Mm hmm. And can you explain to the jury a little bit about what that is? Mm hmm. Someone, I know I did it on my phone. It's just on the internet. You go through the internet on your phone and you could chat with different people in different areas. Do you know if it's similar to like Moco Space, MySpace, those kind of social networking sites, except this one's geared mostly towards dating? Mm, it's somewhat similar to them. Okay. Do you know what Moco Space is? Yes. Okay. Um, do you have a Moco Space account? No. Did you used to? Yes. Do you know if the defendant had a Moco Space account? I believe he did at the time. Okay. And when you say at the time, are you talking about last summer? Yes. Okay. And how do you know that? Because I'm the one who showed him how to get on there. Okay. Do you remember when that was? Mm, I'm not sure. I want to say maybe like May or something, May, June. May of 2008, possibly? Correct. Okay. Um, so let's go back a minute. You said that you were with him last summer and the year before. Um, when did you first meet him? Mm, summer, May of 2007. Okay. And were the two of you involved from May 2007 up until the point of his arrest, or was there a break in between? Somewhat of a breaking point. Okay. It, but the two of you got together, got yes. back together? Yes. Okay. And when was that? Mm, I want to say maybe towards the end of May, beginning of June. Of 2008? Yes. And how long were you together the first time when you got together back in May of 2007? Mm, a few months, I'm not sure. Probably like maybe like seven, eight months or something. Okay. So you guys were in each other's lives for quite a while? Correct. Total. Okay. Do you feel that you knew the defendant well? Yes. How would you describe him? Mm. He's different, a quiet person, and she really know him. Do you know him? He's really friendly, outgoing, very family person. Do you think that he's easy to get along with? Somewhat, if you know him. What about his temper? Mm -hmm. He could be a little hot-headed at times. Do you remember talking to um, Detective Greg, Greg Tharp in this case about the defendant? Yes. Do you remember telling him that the defendant was, quote, a snap cat? Yes. What does that mean? That if he got angry, he snapped out of situation right away. He somewhat he got angry. He was quick to get angry. Quick to get angry? Mm -hmm. I think you said he had a temper just a minute ago. How was he patience-wise? He's good. He has patience. Do you remember telling Detective Tharp that you actually thought he was impatient? No. No? Do you ever know if, or do you know if the defendant ever hit himself? He has before. Over what? Just being angry. Object, or, Your Honor, I think that this is relevant. It goes to the defendant's, um, his temperament, I guess, is what I will say. Are the court gonna overrule the objection? Go ahead. Over what? When he'd be angry at times, he'd hit himself. What kind of things would he get angry over that he would hit himself? The situations where we'd be arguing.
Are you still involved in a relationship with him? No. Okay. Um, are the two of you still in contact? Somewhat. Okay. What do you mean by that? We write occasionally. Okay. When's the last time that you received a letter from him? Maybe last week sometime. And the last time you wrote one? Mm -hmm. The week prior to that. So you were, in, were you involved in a relationship with him back in July of 2008? Yes. And were the two of you spending a lot of time together during that month? Yes. Was there one particular part of the month more than the other that you were spending time together? Mm, not really. Okay, so that whole month? Yes. Okay. Um, let's talk about... The day of Saturday, July 12th. Do you remember that day? Do you remember going to a party on that day where the defendant was? No. No? Do you remember talking to Officer Tharp and telling him about a party that you had went to? Not on a Saturday. No, maybe it was a Friday. Maybe I'm mistaken. This was the weekend before all of this happened. No, we went to a barbecue on a Sunday, but we didn't go to a party on a Saturday or a Friday. Okay, so a barbecue on a Sunday? Yes. Okay. And when you say we went, the two of you went together? Yes. And um, were the two of you getting along at that time? Yes. Okay. Do you remember talking to the defendant about that weekend on the phone and telling him that you felt that he was shining you on that weekend? I think I'm thinking of the weekend prior to that, I mean, or after that happened. Mm -hmm. um, I know what you're talking about. I went out that night, and I know what you're talking about now. It was a Saturday I went out, and I went to go see him a Saturday afterwards, and we're talking about the conversation on the phone. Okay, and so that was before yes. any of this happened, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. So now that we're on the same page, let's talk about that night that oh. you went out. Mm -hmm. um, what were you doing that evening? I went to a party. Okay. And did you go see the defendant at some point? I did after I went out. Okay. And how did that go? It was okay. It was different. Tell us what you mean by that. Mm -hmm. Things kind of weren't like really the same with us. I was involved with somebody else. And I don't know, we're kind of just trying to mend our relationship to what it was before. I felt like he was kind of distant with me. <clears throat> and did you see him the next day or that weekend again before he wasn't around anymore? I seen him that weekend and I seen him, I believe, later on that week. Okay. And when you say later on that week, are you talking about uh, the 17th of July? I believe it was a Thursday. I don't know if it was the 17th. So on Thursday, um, what did the two, where did you see him at? Let's start there. He came to my house. Okay. And when he came to your house, what did he come to your house in? A PT cruiser. Okay. I'm going to have you look over here to your right, and I'm going to show you an exhibit that's already been admitted. I'm sorry, over to your left. Um, exhibit 29. Is that the PT cruiser you're talking about? Yeah. Okay. So on the 17th, he showed up at your house in that car? Yes. And what did the two of you do on the 17th? We went to go have dinner. And where did you go? To a Mexican restaurant up the street. And did anything notable happen that evening, or did the two of you just spend time together? We just spent time together. Did you stay together that evening? No. Okay. And when did you see him next? I believe it was that Saturday. Okay. So the 19th? Yes. And where did you see him that day? Um, we hung out the whole day and we ended up by getting a hotel that night. And where did you get a hotel at? In the DTC area. Okay. And when you say you hung out all day, what time did he come over or what time did you go see him that day? Probably about 2 3 o'clock. And what did you do that day? Mm -hmm. We went to the gym and went 
swimming, and after that, we just end up again in the hotel. And how is he acting during this time? Normal. Normal? Mm -hmm. Um, what about affection-wise? How is he acting? Normal. Normal. <coughs> did the two of you, that evening when you stayed at that DTC hotel, did the two of you engage in sexual activity? Yes. And um, do you remember talking to Detective Tharp? and actually telling him that you felt the defendant was being more affectionate, loving, and paying more attention to you than usual? Yes. So that next morning after you left the hotel, where did you go from there? I got my brakes fixed that day, so he took me to my friend's house, or actually we went to go pick up my car. And then I went to get my brakes fixed. And that was pretty much it. Afterwards, I went home. And did you spend more time with him between that date and the time that he was arrested? Yes. I want to show you a couple of pictures, again, over on your left-hand side. Picture number 52, People's Exhibit 52. That picture was taken during the time frame, correct, those two weeks we're talking about? I'm not sure exactly when that picture was taken. Okay. Do you know where that picture was taken? At my house. At your house? Okay. What about picture 53, People's Exhibit 53? That was taken at a bar we went to. And when did you go to that bar? The exact date, I can't remember. Sometime within that two weeks? Within that time frame, yeah. Okay. So tell the jury a little bit about the other things you guys did together during that two weeks. You said that you went to the bar in that one picture. Mm -hmm. What else did you guys do? Went to a barbecue, just hung out at the park. Um, during this time frame, when you were spending time with the defendant, was he driving that PT cruiser? Some of the times. Okay. And the other times, were you the one that was driving? Yes. Okay. And did you ever travel with him in that car? Yes. Okay. Did you ever talk to him about where that car came from? Yes. What did he tell you? That he got it through a co-worker at the company he was working for. And did he tell you how he was paying for it? He was doing payments. And did he tell you whether or not he had to go someplace to pick it up? Yes. What did he tell you? He told me how to pick it up somewhere. I'm not sure what city he said. I didn't know it was far, but I didn't know location. I know I wanted to say it started with a B, but I'm not sure. Okay. And I th do you remember talking to Greg Tharp in yes. this case? Do you think that maybe you would have told him that you thought possibly it was Bailey? Yeah, I think I said it might have been Bailey, but I'm not sure. Okay. You said that he told you that he was purchasing it from someone at work. Do you actually now know whether or not he was working during that time? I'm not sure. He told you he was, though, right? Yes. The jury's going to hear some jail calls um, between you and the defendant, and I want to ask you a little bit something about it before I play one of them. Um, about his work situation. Do you remember questioning him about his working situation and whether he was actually working or not? Yes. And what was it that you remember him telling you? Was he working from the time this incident happened? Yes. Objection relevance. Your Honor, I think it is relevant. Again, it goes to whether or not the defendant was being truthful with Ms. Mendoza and whether or not Smith. About the purchase of the vehicle? Yes. It's all over the objection. So, um, I'm sorry, from the time that this incident occurred until the time that he was arrested, you questioned him about whether or not he was working, and do you remember him telling you that he wasn't? No. You don't? Okay. During that time that the two of you spent together, those last two weeks of July, what did the two of you talk about? 
about our future. What about your future? Together, you mean? Yes. Okay. Planning for it? Yes. And how many times throughout that two-week period do you think that the two of you engaged in sexual activity? Objection, relevance. Your Honor, can we make a record about this? Sure. Okay, at the bench? Yes. Thank you. We're going to move on a little bit. Um, during this two-week time frame prior to July 30th, um, did you receive any gifts from the defendant during that time? Yes. What? Roses. Okay, and when was that? Mm -hmm. Not Thursday. So the 17th of July? Correct. Okay. Anything else? Mm -hmm. He gave me some purses, but that was, I don't know the date on that, that I actually received the purses. If I could approach your honor. Sure. Ms. Mendoza, I'm handing you what's been marked as People's Exhibit 82 and People's Exhibit 83. Do you recognize these as the persons that were gifted to you by the defendant? Yes. And you said you're not quite sure when he gave you those, is that correct? Correct. You have just a moment. though that these purses were gifted some to you sometime in that two week time frame yes okay and these were used purses correct yes were they empty or full they were empty did the defendant tell you where he got these purses from yes what did he tell you that a friend in the apartments where he was living had got them and he asked him if he wanted any of them and he took them ones he asked me if i wanted them do you remember talking to Detective Tharp about this um, gifting of purses? Yes. Do you remember telling him that the defendant actually told you he found them on this, that his friend had either found them on the street or had possibly stolen them? Yes. And you accepted these gifts, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, did the defendant normally gift you with things? Sometimes. Did you think it was unusual? for him to be doing it no. when he, no. Do you remember talking to Detective Tharp and telling him that it was unlike the defendant to gift you items? The roses, I know I told him that. The roses, okay. So not necessarily the purses, but you were talking about the roses? Yes. Okay. And what did you do with those purses? I had them in my possession, I kept them. Did you use one of them? Mm, I used the town one, I believe. Okay. Um, and at some point, did you turn those over to law enforcement? Yes. Okay, and that would be Detective Tharp? Yes. And the day that he came to see you, did you have one of those purses with you? I did. Okay, and where was the other one? In my trunk. Okay. And where at in your trunk? Mm, it was underneath some clothes or something in the trunk. Okay. Was it slightly hidden? Yes. Why was that? Because my mom questions me when I bring home stuff. So after the defendant was arrested on July 30th, did you speak to him via telephone? Yes. Okay. Your Honor, per stipulation, we've agreed to admit uh, people 65, and I'd like to play that call for the jury at this time. Any objection? No objection. There is a stipulation? There is. So 65 is received into evidence. You're welcome to publish. And do you have the master control on? Yes. Or audio on, Judge? Call number eight. Seven, 
30. Time. Two, zero, one, nine, two, zero. Dial number. Home station. Three, four, one, one. Prep, prep for calls within. Please say your name at the tone. Hey. Hello, you have a call from hey. an inmate at Adams County Detention Center. To accept this call, press 5. To refuse this call, hang up. We are unable to complete this call as a collect call. Please stay on the line for a one-time complimentary call provided by Inmate Calling Solutions. At the end of your call, you will be automatically connected to our call center so that you may make payment arrangements allowing you to receive future calls from hey. an inmate at Adams County Detention Center. This call may be recorded and is subject to monitoring at any time. You may begin speaking now. Hey. So again, false promises and false things are going to happen. That's really bad. What'd you do? It was a mistake, totally, you know, but when it happened, it happened. What'd you do? Somebody, somebody died. Who died? Somebody. Who? When I wasn't talking to you, I started trying to meet people, and I met this person, this female, or I thought it was a female, and then I found out on a meeting that it wasn't, and I, I just snapped, I swear. And, you know, when I was kicking with you, I don't know, I knew my time was limited, you know, I knew I was just wanted to have a good time with you, you know, I knew I was limited on my time. I didn't know what else to do. They're going to hang up on us, Ben. You kill somebody? I can't say that. We're on the phone. They're going to hang up on us, okay? Please stand by to be connected to the customer service center. Ms. Mendoza, was that a call between you and the defendant? Yes. And was that the first call you received after uh, the homicide? Yes. And at some point in that call, the defendant states when he wasn't talking to you, he started trying to meet people. Um, what did he mean by that? Because you just told us a minute ago that you had been with him that weekend before. Like I said, Objection, speculation. Are you guessing about this or, or speculating, or do you know the answer to that? I know the answer. Okay, and so I will overrule the objection. Go ahead. So prior to the time before that happened, like I said, we weren't exactly together. We were somewhat together, but not all the way together. Mm -hmm. We were spending some time together, but not a lot of time together. And you had been with him just that prior weekend? Yes. Okay. Um, I'd now like to play People's Exhibit 66, which we've also stipulated to the admission of. Any objection? No objection. 66 is admitted. Just for the record, to be for place, there was a stipulation um, after the court had entered an order. I'm, we're not waiving our initial objection to any of the phone call with Ms. Tyree or any of these, but there was a stipulation after the ruling. Thank you. So 66 uh, is received into evidence. You're welcome to publish. Thank you. Hello. This is a collect call from... Hi. An inmate at Weld County Jail. This call is subject to recording and monitoring. To accept charges, press 1. To refuse charges, press Thank you for using Evercom. You may start the conversation now. Hey. Hello. Hey. How you doing? Pass in, eating. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I couldn't call earlier. They just barely got me out of bed. I'm in the pod now. Hold on. Let me go outside. Okay. Okay, all right. Man, this sucks. Yeah, it fucking sucks. I don't know. Why don't you tell me? I didn't, I, I, I know our time was limited. I just wanted our time together to be happy and see you smiling and you buy anything. I knew it was fucked up. Well, how can you make promise for me that we're going to have a life together and you knew you were going away forever? Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna be forever. It sucks. It might not be that 
say this forever. Might not be. But then you're probably gonna get like 25. I mean, I know, I know me and you ain't gonna have, but you know, what, what we promised each other and what we wanted, but, you know, in the end, and yeah. you know what? I don't even think that what you did was wrong. I know that person fucking deserved it, but like, you should have fucking came at me. Like, I swear, you should have fucking addressed me. Like, you know, you know what? Why were you? What, what were you fucking thinking, Alan? Driving that fucking car? What were you fucking thinking? I, 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 I wanted to face it. I mean, that think that's the only thing I could think of. I just wanted to face it in, in time. I was, you fucking would have came at me. I would have fucking gave you money to fucking bounce out of the state. I swear to God, I would have. I know you would have. But I didn't want that. You know what I mean? You know, if, like I said, if I can't have a life out there with you, I really didn't give a fuck about having one out there at all. And I, I ain't going to try to drag you into it. You know what I mean? <laughs> that was the last thing I was going to do, but drag you into it. All this fucked up shit, you know? <laughs> oh. I can't deal with this shit. It's been fucking horrible for me because people just keep calling me and this is on the news and I just... Every time I just try to try to turn away from it, it's like there in my face. Uh -huh. It's bad. You know, it's, it's really bad. But what am I gonna do? You lie to me about you working true? I I don't understand you. I don't understand. Well, after that happened, I just like I say, I just wanted you to be happy. So did you work at all at that window place? How did you get that fucking check them? Yeah, I worked there. You need to come playing with me with everything. No, oh, yeah, I worked there. I worked there up until she hit the pan. Up until she hit the pan with this place, with this thing. Then when, when she hit the pan with this, I just I stopped everything, you know what I mean? I was like, you know, I stopped everything. The only thing I was focusing on is just spending my last time with you, you know? Being around you. So, <laughs> being your face. Spending time with you, making me happy. That's all I really wanted. You, know, I know. you were making me a promise if we were at the park. We are talking about having our life together. Why couldn't you tell me? I was going to tell you. I swear to God I was going to tell you Friday. I swear I was. I, just, I swear I was. I was going to tell you. I was going to tell you everything. You know, I was going to get a little bit of money and I was going to tell you everything. Just. My mom was like, so is that right? She was like, I know I don't like you being with me. She was like, and I told you. Like, she was mad at me, but she was like, you don't deserve the death penalty. All the fucking... The fucking Vegas was trying to give me the fucking death penalty. She said that she's gonna get a thing, you know, I guess that my pastor has like this, some type of hookup in like Washington and that uh, she'll fucking, she, I need to find out your fucking, um, like what is it, like your case number thing and what judge you're gonna go before. And she's gonna get like a petition started where she could get so many signatures behind it. Did you talk to my sister at all? Yeah, I talked to her today, finally. I talked oh. to that girl last night. Oh. Not your ex. Oh, she's mad, huh? About what? I mean. I don't know. She's like upset. Like, you know, everybody's saying the same thing, though. You know, you know, that fucking person got with They fucking hit trend. Like, was it the first time you fucking met that person? Yeah, like, everything man. happened that same night? Or you chilled with yeah. them for a minute or what? Oh, everything happened right then and there. Like, it was weird. Like, Everything and you know what's fucked up, Alan, is you told me in a way, but you couldn't fucking tell me, like, how you said that you wanted to grade me for the fourth. Uh huh. No, it was it was before it was after the fourth. It was a little bit after that, but I mean, you know, I, I it was like, so hard. <laughs> I'm never gonna see you again. It sucks. What if I'm fucking pregnant? You're having sex with me all the time, so we weren't using nothing. What if I'm fucking pregnant? That's like the biggest decision I have to fucking make in my life. Well, take care of my my kids. How are you gonna take care of your kid being fucking locked up? I mean, you take care of my kid, you know? <laughs> raise, raise, raise him or her eye, you know? It's fucked up. Like, I call my cousin this morning and crying. And she's like, well, she's like, I had a dream you're putting this. It's like, I hope you're not. You know, you always told me, you know, you always told me all you wanted was <laughs> and all that shit. Well, if it happens that way, but, you know, it'll be a great mom, you know, I know it. <laughs> Do you know how fucking stupid I look at work? 
I told him I had to explain to everybody. I'm like, well, where are we on the break then? Like, you know, I didn't know what I wanted. He didn't know what he wanted. I'm like, yeah, that's my man. Well, that's, that doesn't change nothing. You know, we were together. It's just, that shit happened. I mean, that don't change nothing. We, 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 were, we were happy. You couldn't even tell me that you were talking to somebody. This was before. This is when you told me, oh, fuck that. You know, you didn't know what you wanted. And, it wasn't and I blame myself. I blame myself for that day. And you were in my car. You got through shit. I blame myself. You know, we could have maybe had a happy life. And I was told you I was ready to be with you. None of this would never happen. So hard. <laughs> you know, last time, I couldn't hold my, you know, hold myself up. You know, I couldn't, you know, being without you, you know, I couldn't do that. This time, <laughs> I know I can't, I can't, I can't do it. The kind of person I am. And everybody's like, he's a bad person, he's a bad person. You just fucked up Shane's vibe. But Alan, I know you love me. I know. The way you can look at me, I know you love me. I do, I do, still, and I'll never stop. I just, I fucked up in life, and there's two people living inside of this person. I'm telling you, it's the truth. I can't sometimes discern between the two, and I'm not, that's not a cop-out. That ain't a cop-out. There's two people, you know what I mean? But both of them love you, I swear. Can you get calls? Can you call still, like, later on? Can you call me tomorrow? Because I'm at a restaurant right now. They're probably like, what the fuck's going on? She just called me out. Um, I don't know how much money you put on. I, don't know how much I have 20 bucks on my phone. <laughs> okay, well, I'll call you tomorrow. Um, you, you, are you going to write me or what? I don't know, Alan. I don't know. It's a lot of shit right now going through my head. Well, it don't have to be, you know, like I said, it don't have to be nothing like together. You know, just, just companionship. <laughs> yeah, you know, I can fucking, I can't be with you now. You're going to be gone forever. Like, I you know. don't realize that. Why, like... Babe, look, I know, I understand that she got mad and you fucking snapped. But when you're doing that, like, why could you just fuck, fuck it up just like a minute and just fucking leave? Like, after I, you fucking realize that you, why could you think to me? Like, when you're doing that, like, think that, I you know, you were going to be out of my life know. forever. I don't know. It happened so freaking fast and so hard. I, they couldn't stop it, I swear. It was one of those things that just, that happens on TV. You know, you don't think it's going to happen to you, but I swear to God. I, I, was, I started thinking about everything after, you know, like after the fact, I was like, fuck, 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 I knew it was over. Why so is I, that, girl? Why, I just want to know, you know, before all this happened, like, were you really planning, you know, to start to work and to be with, like, together with just me before all this situation yeah. happened? Yeah, that's exactly, yeah, uh, that's really the whole thing I wanted. Because when I asked her, I was like, was he working? She was like, no, he wasn't working. She was like, he was working at the Family Dollar for a while. She's going to tell you, I mean, I was working, you know, up until then. But, be honest know, with me. Be honest with me. You ain't gonna lie to me no more. No, I know. I work at that place though, and I work at the Family Dollar. But when that shit hit the fan, though, I stopped. You know what I mean? That's the truth. I quit. You know, I wasn't gonna be putting shit. Why didn't you tell me you worked at the Family Dollar? I don't know. Because you know, because I was working, and I already had a thing going when I told you I was working, and it just it just didn't dawn on me to, you know, I you know I should have. I should have been totally straight up with you, but... You know, you love me so much, like, I don't understand how you can hurt me and lie to me about so many things. Well, when that thing happened, I just, I swear, you know, I did it just because I wanted to see your smiling face every day, you know, because I knew it was going to be the... But why? Why would you continue? Like, you could have still been out here if you would have told me, like... They're gonna fucking look at that. They're gonna see like, yeah, that fucking person had no remorse. He was fucking driving her car around for fucking three weeks, or its car around for fucking three weeks. <laughs> You fucking kicked with me that fucking weekend in the hotel. You fucking bought me roses and took me to eat like a day after that happened. I was trying to forget, you know? I was trying to forget that, like... It was so hard on me. Like, I swear that night that happened. I just kept thinking, I'm like, let this be a dream. Let this be a bad dream. And fucking yesterday, the fucking day before, I was numb. Like, I was cool, but I was, like, fucking numb to it all. And this this morning, I fucking took my walk to work. And after that, I just fucking broke down crying. Everybody's at work. They're like, you don't look good. You don't look good, girl. Are you okay? I mean, when I, when I, when I tell you this, I don't want you to take it the wrong way, but, you know, I love you. You know, I don't want you to think I don't, but it's just... That shit happened, and I just wanted to see you smiling. You know, the last days of my my life out there, I wanted it to be happy. You know, take you out there. That's why you told me that. That shit in my head. You're like, I'm giving you everything you wanted. Be you happy. Oh.
like, I told my uncle Gina, I was like, you don't understand. I was like, I said, I'm gonna sleep before I left him. I was like, we had our ups and downs. I was like, you know, that wasn't just like my mouth. I was like, that was my friends. I was like, I was fucking so comfortable with them in every which way. Yeah. Are you, you want me to call you tomorrow or are you okay? <laughs> yeah, call me tomorrow. I gotta go back in there. What time? I'm going to be all fucked up. What time? <sighs> if you can, like in the morning, somewhat, like around my 10. Okay, um, it's not like later does, afternoon. Does it, does it tell you how much you had and how much you spent on a call? No. <laughs> She said own. that bro said it's like, what she say, like 15 minutes for like four bucks or something like that. Okay. Well, so we but I'll meet tomorrow. I'll meet you tomorrow like around 10, okay? Okay. So sorry. I love you. I love you too. Bye. The person you called has hung up. So, Ms. Mendoza, in that conversation, that was also a conversation between you and the defendant, correct? Yes. Okay. During that conversation, um, you asked him about making promises of a life together with you and why he was lying to you about that. Um, explain to the jury a little bit what you mean by that. What kinds of things was he telling you? Just about us having kids and getting a house and starting a family. And this conversation took place at the park, I think you said in that phone call? Yes. Is that one of the places that you were telling us earlier that the two of you spent time together during that two weeks? Yes. On that phone call, you talked to him about that girl, his ex. Um, what was your relationship with her? I didn't know her. I just knew her from the time I talked to her after the situation happened. And you know that to be Angie Tyree, correct? I don't know her name. You don't know her name? Okay. Do you know who the defendant was living with? Mm -hmm. Yeah, her. During that phone call, um, you questioned the defendant about how this situation came about. And he told you that everything happened right then and there. Um, has he ever deviated from that with you? No. He also told you, or you questioned him about coming up to Greeley because at that point you knew that's where this had occurred, correct, mm -hmm. in Greeley? Um, you said something about him coming up to Greeley around the 4th. What did he tell you about that? He told me on the 4th of July, but I think that might have been something else with the people that he was actually staying with. Okay. So do you know if he actually came up to Greeley on the 4th of July? Not sure. You talked to him a little bit in that phone call, um, and you're very upset and you're blaming yourself for what has happened. You tell him that um, none of this would have happened if I would have told you I wanted to be with you. You were in my car that day and you lost your shit. What does that mean? No, I said that you had, I gave you your shit. Oh, you gave me your shit. Just meaning about when me and him first got back together, I had to kind of make a choice because I was already involved in a relationship. And I told him that I didn't want to be with him no more. And so that would have been around the second time that the two of you started dating, so maybe back in May of 2008? Is that the time frame you're talking about? Probably. Okay. But after that point, the two of you did talk. You said that you had went to a party and you had seen him and stuff like that. Yes. So you had been having a relationship of sorts? Somewhat. Okay. You also questioned him in that phone call about how he could hurt you and lie to you about so many things. What things in particular were you talking about that he was lying to you about? Just about the whole situation, about him working. About him working and the whole situation, you mean him coming up here? Yes. All right, pursuant to stipulation, um, I'm going to also ask that Exhibit 67 be admitted in play. There is, Judge, and we're still not waiving our earlier. Understood. It's People 67 is received into evidence. You're welcome to publish. Hello. This is a collect call from... Hey. An inmate at Weld County Jail. This call is subject to recording and monitoring. 
To accept charges, press 1. To refuse charges, press 2. To prevent calls from this facility, press 6. For a rate quote, press 7. Thank you for using Evercom. You may start the conversation now. Hey. Uh, morning. Good morning. Up. Huh? Just wake up. Yeah. Shall we go up? No, I kind of woke up myself. Well, I saw on that tent, but don't go. I figured you were snoring. No, my phone was on silent. I forgot. Uh, yeah. What'd you eat last night? What'd I eat? Yeah, you said you had a restaurant, no? Yeah, I ate a catfish and tried. My homegirl, oh, it's wrong. She's all, your eyes are all. She's like, you're crying. I was like, no, I wasn't. She's like, you can't lie. She's like, I hope that's the last time. She's like, you talk to him. I'm like, shut up. Who told you that? Oh. Uh, that's kind of mean. I mean, it's not like we're going to get together or anything, but just that's kind of mean, though. Okay. Can't say nothing about that. What are you doing today? Nothing. Okay, my shit for Vegas. Well, I'm even gonna go and I'm off. Like, I need to go. I need to get away from all this. I need a break. My mom was tripping. She didn't want to let me go. She's like, you lie. This and that. You're talking to him. I was like, Mom, don't do this to me. I was like, I need to get away from all this shit. I need a break. Yeah. What'd she say? She's like, you know what? She's like, I want to let you go. She's gonna let you go. Like, what does she mean by that? You stay. It sucks. Like I'm used to, like all I used to spending my time with you, and I don't have that no more. No. I used to seeing your your face, you know, seeing you happy, just seeing you, you know, even when you were mad at me. I don't know, just having you around. I just when that, when that, all that shit happened, I just wanted to have that, you know, as much as possible till the end, you know. How could you ask like nothing? Like, you know, like I thought but, like you love me and that you could confide in me, like I don't I wasn't gonna no, no, no. It's not like I wasn't gonna tell you, I was gonna tell you. And that's the God honest truth, because I was gonna you know, I just I wanted you know, I wanted us to have time. And like I don't understand like what you were thinking, like you wanted to get pop. It's not that. I just I didn't you know. You I did. Felt, well, kind of, I mean it's not I don't know. I didn't have nothing, nowhere to go. You know what I mean? I didn't have nowhere to turn. I didn't have no money. I didn't have nothing. You know, I didn't have nothing going for me. You know, I didn't want to drag you into it. You know, I was gonna tell you, but I was also gonna say, don't. You know, don't, don't put yourself out there for me. You know? Be honest with me though. Like, were you fucking with anybody that I need to worry that I need to get checked? Like, were you no. fucking with any female? No, no. That's the God's honest truth. No. Uh, bro, you know, I always told you I wouldn't put you in a situation like that, and to this day, it's true, uh, you know, I w I've always wanted nothing but good for you, you know, even though I mess up, how you think, the lie and stuff. Um, no, nothing like that. You can, you know, you can feel free to do what you want to do and go get checked or whatever, but, you know, I think you know, I never really mess with nobody. Stupid. And you know what sucks too is like when you met it that weekend you were like fucking shying me off. That's like when you were being so mean to me. Well, I mean, I thought, we're, I thought me and you were just gonna move on, you know? We, we had the problems. I thought me and you were just gonna be not, not us, you know what I mean? I was trying to get over it, you know, trying to get over you move on. I couldn't do it, but I was trying. Yeah, that shit just, that shit just happened. Just like everything up totally. Like that Saturday when I went to go see you and you just like, I like you didn't care about me no more. What do you mean when you went to go see me? No, I went to go see you when I was at that party. What do you mean? I act like I didn't care. I cared. I was trying to talk to you that day. I was trying to, I was trying to, you know, get you to stay. You're like, I don't know what to tell you. 
Well, I was off, but I was bad, you know. I wasn't doing too good with my hands, but I mean. That's like even before that happened, though. Like, that's the weekend before that happened. But you know. So, like, I don't know. I don't understand. That's all water under the bridge, you know. But, you know, there's a lot of things about how I conducted myself that you ain't ever gonna understand, I guess. You know, I could sit here and tell you things. You know, if we continue to talk periodically from time to time, everything will come out, you know, everything you ever wanted to know, you all know, but there's still things you ain't gonna understand. You know, there's things I don't understand. It is what it is, you know, it's done deal. Now, now the only thing is we can just talk, you know, I can have a little, you know, little side support, you know, I'm not asking you for a whole lot of dedication, but... You know, I do want to, I do want to hear your voice from time to time. Maybe you know, maybe get a letter, postcard, a postcard from Vegas or something. You know, let me know it's doing good. You know. It was so hard. Like everything was so good before you went in. I was starting to fall back in love with you. I know. I know. You know, the whole time after that happened, I know, I knew I was gonna hurt you. You know, and it, but I couldn't. Myself. Why? Why would you play with my emotions like that? Like, I didn't deserve it. I didn't. I was going to tell you, I swear. It was going to happen. It was going to happen Friday when I would have to come up with a text for that day. I was going to tell you. I was going to say, look, this is it. This is what's going on. I was hoping to be out three more days so we could have a night where I could tell you things. You know, I didn't want to tell you. You know, when you had to work and all of that. That's not what I wanted. I wanted to tell you that shit whenever, uh, you know, you could do good, take it in. But believe me, it was going to happen. I was going to tell you everything. And I was going to go from there. You know, I was scared. You know, I was a little bit scared of the, your, your, your reaction. But I was going to tell you. But I wanted you to have time. You know, not have to work or, you know, I wanted because I knew it was going to be a shock, you know. Why do you think I fucking asked you? I asked you for a reason. I was like, why are you on the bisexual side when you're on Uncle's face? Yeah, then people are fucking own. weird on there. Then people are fucking weird. You need to fucking talk to a fucking... I thought I didn't fucking meet you right away. How long did it take before I met you? It fucking took almost like a month before I met you. No, I didn't. Yeah, I did. I talked to you for a minute on the phone. We talked for at least... I texted you for like at least a week, two weeks before I even started talking to you. Oh, yeah, yeah. You didn't even want to talk on the phone with me. You didn't even want to hear my voice for like two weeks. <sighs> I know that now. I mean, but... I wasn't on there looking for nothing like that. I just, I don't know what the hell. It was weird. I don't know what the hell. You know? And if you were looking to get some, like, why didn't you come to me, like? What? I said, if you were just looking to get some, like, why didn't you come to me or why didn't you ask me? Well, no, whenever we were, whenever we were going through all that, you know, you were pretty much, you were pretty much going through your little stage with me, like you were done with me and not really no it wasn't no it wasn't it was that weekend when i went to go see you i remember i went to go see you that saturday after the party and i went to go see you that sunday you gave me face that sunday after i went out to the bar yeah and then you met whoever on that monday or tuesday or wednesday yeah i don't know i don't know what so it wasn't like you know you were still fucking with me too like i don't i don't get it i don't i mean I don't know either. It was just one. I don't know. I don't know what. The, I don't know. You know, you say you love me, but yet you were looking for something else. Like I don't. I don't know. No, I mean, it, to this day, to this day, that's true. And it's always gonna be that way, no matter, no matter what happens in my life, or no matter what happens, it's always gonna be that way. That I do love you, you know. I will. I always got. I always have love for you, you know. But you know how how we're living out there wasn't totally, totally good. And the thing is, I also knew. That to a point, I knew that I might not be good for you, you know what I mean? Plain and simple. It didn't have nothing to do with me. It had, had everything to do with you, you know? I wanted it's to just like, what went wrong? Like, you know, what backfired? You know, you were going to fucking work. We were going to be together and this and that. And it's just like everything, like, I don't get it. Well, that went wrong. That, 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 that one moment, that one moment was so bad that I can't explain it. I don't even know what happened. I just, I mean, I know what happened, but I don't know how or why or how I reacted that way. And, you know, me and you could have worked through our little problems, you know? You know, we could have had, we could have had bigger problems. Me and you could have worked through it. You know, I don't, like I said, you could have cheated on me. You could have, you could have, 
he down there could have got pregnant with somebody else, and that's, we still could have worked through it. But that one thing right there was just, it was something that was uncontrollable. I can't explain it. I couldn't. I was outside of myself. I wasn't even acting as a coherent person. Afterward, yeah, I said, you know, afterward I was in shock, and I didn't know what to do, but during and all that, I was, I was outside. I didn't know what was happening. It was, a, it was over before I even knew it started. You know, I didn't, that wasn't a conscious decision I made to do that. You know, I didn't sit here and say, I'm just going to do this. No, it didn't happen like that. It just happened. I can't explain it. That, nothing like that ever happened to me in my whole entire life. You know, I can't explain that, but it's done. I can't do nothing about it. You know, it's over. You know, all our all our bullshit is bullshit between us. If you if you think about this now, you know this is something totally fucked up. You know? Is there anything more like that I'm not knowing, like that the new no. thing saying that you're not telling? No, everything, everything you hear, everything, all that, everything's on the open now. I mean, on the news, everything's out there. You know, there ain't nothing bad. But, you know, I didn't have no sex with this motherfucker or nothing like that. You know, um, I didn't do nothing with nobody else either. Um, I seen fucking pictures yesterday on the fucking news. Like, oh my God, like, without makeup, that fucking looks like a fucking bad, like a lot. I know. I know. Did you see it with makeup, though? Yeah. It's it don't crazy. Look like, it don't look like a guy. And I didn't see it like that. I didn't see it all rugged, all rough. I seen that, too. I was like, how the fuck did I even think that? You know, when I seen that picture, but then I seen other ones, and I remember seeing it. Did there. it have its boobs then? Yeah, well, partial. I think they were partial. I don't know. I didn't even get that far. You know, once I found out, it was... Once I, I didn't even get that far. Once I found out... You know, but pictures and all that you could see, you could see cleavage and shit, pictures and shit, so, you know, I'm sure there was something there, but you know, all that, all that is just bullshit now, I mean, you know, what I'm telling you, what I'm telling you is no bullshit, everything's out there, you know, everything, you know. Somebody, like a female that would be down to fucking take you to her house, got fucking nice. That's like, that's not a good sign. That's like nothing good. No, but you would think it's just a, she's just a hoe or something. You would think, you know, if I were a con, if she's just a hoe, you would think that, right? You wouldn't think nothing like that, though. Like, never in nobody's mind would something like that cross. Never. At least not in my mind. Never, never did it even get close to that vicinity of that happening. Not even close, not even one little beady beady bit would I think it end up like that. You know? But like I say, everything's out there now. You know, you know, you know, you know what I know. Um, and any questions you have asked, I'll tell you about the honest truth on everything, but you know, it's not gonna do me no good. But I want you to know. You know, I want you to know what kind of person you are dealing with. You have no, one minute left. Mendoza, to take you back to not this call, but the call before when you were questioning why the defendant would continue to drive the car. Do you remember in that call he told you because he wanted to get caught? Yes. And then in this call, when you ask him why he was driving the car, it was like he wanted to get caught. He told you, no, it's not that. Do you remember just hearing that? Yes. 
Did you ever get a definitive answer from him on which one it was? No. You questioned him a couple of times throughout this call about whether or not he had been with anybody else, um, telling him, be honest with me. Like, were you fucking with anybody that I need to worry about, that I need to get checked? Like, were you fucking with anything else? And he tells you, no, no, no. And he told you that throughout the conversation. Did he ever deviate from that? No. The two of you were talking about um, him being on the bisexual side of MoCo space. Do you remember hearing that in that conversation? Yes. You had recalled that he had been looking at that. How did you know he was looking at that? Because when you go online, you can see who's on there and what they're in any chat rooms that will say next to their name. And had he used your phone at some point? Is that how you were able to see that? Or were you looking at his profile I from yours? I was on my phone, looking at my profile. Okay. And you could see where he was at that point? Yes. Okay. And it showed that he was on a bisexual chat room, kind of? Yes. Again, in this conversation, um, one of the reasons that he gives you for why this happened is because you were, quote, done with him. Do you remember hearing him say that a minute ago? Yes. And you told him, no, no, it wasn't like that. You even went and saw him that weekend. So is this still that weekend before this yes. happened that we were talking about? Um, when you went to go see him after the party? Yes. Okay. You said in that audio that he gave you face that weekend. What does that mean? Oral sex. And I think he tells you at least a couple more times in that phone call, and I'm going to point him out to you in just a second, about him not being with anybody other than you. Is that right? Correct. He tells you that he didn't have no sex with this motherfucker or nothing like that. I didn't do nothing with nobody else either. And he stayed true to that, never told you anything different? No. When you talk to him about whether um, this person whose home he had been at, whether or not they had real or fake boobs, he told you he didn't even get that far. Did he ever say anything different to you, or was that always his stance? He never got that far. And that's all I heard of that. You tell him during this conversation that he's selfish. Can you explain for the jury why you thought that at the time? Just throughout the time we were spending together, and he was making me think of like our future. We were gonna have something, and he knew really what was going on in the situation. So he's making these false promises to you. Yes. And there at the very end, one more time, um, you talk to him about why he would continue to have sex with you unprotected, and again he told you because he wasn't doing anything. Did he ever say anything different to you? No. And I have a question. Throughout this call, there's probably at least three separate occasions where he tells you that's a God honest truth, that's a God's honest truth, that's a God's honest truth. Is that how he usually went about telling you things? Was he always having to validate to you that he was telling the truth? Objection. Relevance. I think it goes to whether or not the defendant was being truthful with her during these phone calls, if it was um, something that he had done before. I'll overrule the objection. Go ahead. Just to like my religious respect aspect, like honest to God, like when I'd ask him something, he'd be like honest to God or I'd put that on God or whatever. Okay. So in your mind, because that was something that he respected your religion by doing it, he was... Um, being more serious than just saying something? I don't know if he was doing it on my behalf or if he was just saying it. Okay. Judge, we still have at least two more phone calls that are going to take quite some time. Do we want to stop for tonight? You think this is a good logical point to stop? Yes. Okay. So we, you're welcome to step down. Okay. You're going to be ordered to return at 8.30 in the morning uh, to continue your testimony, okay? 8.30 tomorrow morning? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Set up.
I got it clear it was my job, but I, they told me it was today and that was it. Okay, I apologize for running a little bit late. I'm sure you can make arrangements with the prosecutor, but you need to be here at 8.30, okay? Okay. You're welcome to step down if you like. We are going to recess for the day. I appreciate um, your hard work today, and I want to again instruct you um, that until the trial is completed, you must not discuss this case with anyone that includes your family, people involved in the trial, other jurors, or anyone else. If someone approaches you and tries to discuss the trial with you, please let me know about it immediately. It is also important that you must not read or listen to any news reports of this trial of any kind and do not in any way try to gain information about the case outside of the courtroom that includes as an example no research on the internet medical or law books encyclopedias or dictionaries finally it is especially important that you not form or express any opinion on the case until it is finally submitted to you i would like you to be ready to start tomorrow morning at 8 30 in the morning and um we are in recess. Have a great evening. Thank you very much. If everybody can please rise for the jury. <coughs> are there any issues before we recess? No, Your Honor. If I could, I would like to approach and give the stipulated, all the stipulated calls so they're up there for the court. Okay. Thank you. The only issue I had, Judge, is just um, that obviously last week when we were here, um, some of my witnesses, their subpoenas were continued until Wednesday morning at 830 I expect. Do you think I should have? I think what we're discussing is the people think that they will be finished probably by noon. Tomorrow. Um, and so probably. I I will plan to have try to have witnesses here at 1 30 um, if everybody if that seems fine. Okay, that sounds fine. I appreciate you doing that. I also would like to, there's two things I want to take up now. One is I want to do an inventory of the evidence that's been received. And also, I want to know the status of the stipulation of the parties that were reached at the motions hearing regarding the exclusion of a photograph <coughs> and a stipulation as to the defendant being in the PT Cruiser owned by uh, the Zapata family. Um, have the parties reached a written stipulation? We you said you would. We haven't talked about that, Your Honor. I don't think it'll take long uh, to formulate that. Uh, we might ultimately just ask the court to give an oral stipulation. At this okay, point. Can, you, can you draft something that I can read to the jury so that way there's no misunderstanding as to what the stipulation is? If that's what we, if that's what we agree on, Your Honor, yes. Uh, I think we'll reach an agreement on it, though. Okay. Let me do a very quick inventory. And for the record, the exhibits I provided to the court is 65 through 70 inclusive that, is, that are stipulated to. Okay. What What is 69? It's another, it's also a jail phone call. Okay. And so f for the record, Notwithstanding previous objections, it looks like there's a stipulation now based on my ruling to the admission of 68 and 69. Is that right, Ms. Cornelius? That's correct. And so if the court is acknowledging at this point the previous motion that we filed, then tomorrow I won't raise that one. one okay. Those. So with regard to uh, the exhibits, I have the last exhibit is number 103. So let me tell you the ones that are not received into evidence. Perhaps that's the easiest way to do it. Those stipulated ones were actually not 68 and 69. It was 66 and 67 that we gave to the court for a ruling on. I just wanted to make the record clear. Okay, so 68 and 69. There, there was an agreement between the parties as to that. Okay. One. So the exhibits that have not yet been received into evidence are as follows. Between 1 and 103. Sorry, sir. I... I show that uh, number one has not been received into evidence. I show that 55 has not been received. 56 has not been received. 
57 has not been received, 58 has not been received, 64 has not been received, 76, there was a request to admit and I denied, so 76 has not been received, 77 has not been received, 81 has not been received, 91 has not been received, 93 and 94 have not been received. I denied 97A through II inclusive, the MOCO space printouts. 98 and 99 have not been received. I show everything else has. Does everybody agree? Did the court, Your Honor, and I apologize, did you say 54 has not been received? 54 has been received. 55 through 58 inclusive has not. That's correct. That's correct. Yes, that has been received, yes. And then uh, 105 through 110 have not been. You know, and I you must have an updated list. Mine only goes to 94. So perhaps we'll provide you provide the court with an, uh, an updated one. Okay. Here's this accurate, though, you're <laughs> Okay. Okay. Um, and so we'll see you. I would like to get started at 8.30 in the morning. I have um, some... I have two 815 matters that will only take about 15 minutes max, okay? Are there any other issues? No, sir. No, Your Honor. Okay, and so we'll see you tomorrow morning. Thank you. We're in recess.